my name is Elaine Carey, and I am the chair of the history department at St. John's University. That's my one position. And here at the conference, I and my other gig is I am the vice president for the teaching division of the American Historical Association. So I want to welcome all of you to the K through 12 teacher workshop. But before I begin my opening comments, I would like to introduce Allison Thurber, who's the Senior Director of Curriculum and Content Development for History at the College Board. Allison. I should come up here. Welcome. We're very um, pleased to be working with the AHA Teaching Division in uh, sponsoring this workshop. We know that the we know that there's a real need for this kind of education and kind of professional development to happen at the professional meetings, and we're so pleased and happy that all of you are here. We know that there's a stellar lineup of presenters. Um, I just all I wanted to say was that we have these little um, pamphlets right here. I want to pass one to each of you. They're kind of a rip off. Part of it you can. Uh, uh, take this apart and this gives you just a little bit more information about the AP program and gives you some links about where you can go to learn more and then on the other side is a little evaluation form for this session and if you could complete those and at the end just put them on a back chair and we'll collect them. We appreciate that. It's nice for us to get a little bit of feedback about sessions that we help sponsor at the AHA and we'd love to give you as much information as we can about the AP program and hope that some of you here already are um, AP teachers and if there's anything that you need, me and several of my colleagues are here and happy to answer questions if you have any. Um, but I'll let uh, Elaine finish with the rest of the introductions. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Allison. But before we begin, I just want to mention that this is being filmed. So if you have any questions, if you can please come to the microphone when you wish to pose them. Um, before I begin also, I just want to uh, recognize um, my two colleagues on the teaching division that are here. Peter Porter, raise your hand. And Brenda Santos, who's also here. And Dana Schaefer, who has, um, is uh, staff at the American Historical Association and um, worked very hard to put this panel together. So I would like to welcome all of you to Food Will Win the War, a K through 12 educators workshop on teaching World War I. As a historian of crime, I'm interested in the flows of many commodities, including food. While my research focuses on drug trafficking, food has always been a tool of smugglers for many years. Opium smuggled in tea cans, Mexican heroin mixed in masa for tamales and dragged across the border, marijuana buried under fish along the Pacific coast, cocaine and heroin in Argentine and Chilean wine bottles destined for New York City. A couple of weeks ago, I stopped by John Jay College to see a good friend and mentor, Larry Sullivan. He recently published an art book called The Brownsville Boys, Jewish Gangsters of Murder, Inc. In the course of our con conversation about my recent publications, his recent publications, he asked me about the AHA and I mentioned this panel. And he told me a little, little story, which we, as historians we all like stories. The Brownsville Boys evolved out of Arnold Rothstein's organization when it was broken up and in kind of studies of organized crime we call that fractionalization. And um, so the Brownsville Boys inherited part of Rothstein's work and they controlled the garment trade unions and rackets. They controlled allocation for housing in different parts of the city, gambling, extortion, fronts, bail bonds, prostitution, and murdering. So they were kind of a Walmart of vice here in the city. And by the way, just in case you were wondering, a hit ran for $4,500 in 1930. But another racket that they controlled was the flower racket. So when you bought bread in much of this city during the 19-teens to the 1940s, you gave a little to Rothstein or you gave a little to Brownsville Boys or other organized crime groups. So all of a sudden, World War I food and flour rations become even more complex if we start to think about the historical aspects. So food history is multiple faceted, multifaceted, and in this city a constant changing theme from the menu collections at the museums and archives and the photos of family restaurants, food represents one's culture, one's politics, one's social interaction, and for some, one's criminal enterprise. 
And guess what? Students like food, and they like to study food also. So it is a pleasure to be here and to introduce our panel of experts who will address the history of food as it relates to World War I in this workshop, Food Will Win the War. So um, again, I would like to thank the College Board for sponsoring the event, the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, the National History Day, and of course the American Historical Association who were the co-organizers. I also want to just recognize too the History Channel who's uh, had long-term support for the teaching division of the HA. Tonight, today, our panelists include Julia Irwin, who is an associate professor at the University of South Florida. She earned her PhD in history from Yale University, and her research focuses on the place of humanitarianism in 20th century U.S. foreign relations. Her first book, Making the World Safe, the American Red Cross, and a Nation's Humanitarian Awakening, was published by Oxford in 2000, uh, 2013. Excuse me. It is a history of diplomatic and cultural significance of U.S. international civilian relief in the early 20th and particularly during the First World War. She is now working on a second book project called Catastrophic Diplomacy, a history of U.S. responses to global natural disaster. Helen Veit is an assistant professor at Michigan State University. She too specializes in U.S. history in 19th and 20th centuries, focusing on the history of food and nutrition. She received her PhD from Yale University in 2008. Her first book, Modern Food, Moral Food, Self-Control Science and the Rise of American Eating in the Early 20th Century, was published in 2013 by UNC Press, and it explores the origins of modern eating. She is also a project director of What America Ate project funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, a three-year project launched in 2014 to create a digital archive and interactive website focusing on American eating during the Great Depression. Tim Bailey, who, who's here in, in front, is the director of education for the Gilden Lerman Institute of American History. He recently developed the Teaching Literacy Through History program, and the program integrates history instruction with ELA component of the Common Core State Standards by providing content-based curriculum and professional development for educators. In his 20 years in the classroom, he has taught at all levels from elementary to college and almost exclusively working with low-income second language populations. Most recently, uh, he was an eighth grade teacher, U.S. teacher in Salt Lake City. He has worked extensively, extensively with chief authors of the Con Common Core Standards and is recognized as an expert in its implementation. He's currently a fellow with America Achieves as well as serving on Student Achievement Partners Fellow. Among his distinctions, he's University of, of Utah Classroom Teacher of the Year, National History Teacher of the Year. He's also a Fulbright Scholar and a Scholastic Publishing Fellow. Amanda Moniz is the Assistant Director of the National History Center of the American Historical Association. And before pursuing her doctoral education at the University of Michigan, she worked as a pastry chef for several years. She's written on food history for various publications, including the Washington Post and American Food Roots, and teaches occasional historic cooking classes in Washington, DC. Wendy Egan teaches AP World History, Comparative Religion, Sociology, and Anthropology to juniors and seniors at the Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda, Maryland. She is a graduate of Northwestern and has completed graduate studies at American University in Georgetown. She has been the editor of for Visual Literacy at World History Connected, an e-journal for teaching and learning since 2003, and she serves as a table leader at the AP World History Annual Reading and has conducted teacher institutes and seminars as a faculty consultant for the College Board. She served as the World History Association's liaison during the development of the C3 Framework for Social Studies, College, Career, and Civic Life for the past four years. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And she, too, is also a Fulbright Scholar. Um, she had a Fulbright Scholarship to the American University in Cairo. Lynn O'Hara is the director of programs for National History Day. She joined NHD in 2013, following 12 years of classroom experience at the middle and high school level. As a teacher, she received the Patricia 
Bering Teacher of the Year Award in Pennsylvania and was a finalist for the National Award. She is a National Board Certified Teacher and in 2013, a James Madison Fellow from Pennsylvania. Ms. O'Hara has presented on history and education issues at Advanced Placement Summer Conference, NCSS, and the AHA, and she has published on education topics in social education. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Folks, can you guys, can everyone hear? All right, okay. Uh, Helen and I are um, going to start off the presentation today and uh, we're going to sort of talk to you guys about new perspectives on, uh, on the war and on food and humanitarianism and their relationship to World War I. Uh, what we want to do, though, is, um, unless you'd like to speak, uh, we'd like to start out with, um, with a video that we have been working on and producing with American Food Roots, uh, the World War I Museum, and now the AHA as well. Um, and we'll start off there and then we'll move into our presentation. And we'll, we'll talk more about this video as, and, the, and the other videos as we go along. I'm Bonnie Wolf, Managing Editor of AmericanFoodRoots.com. I'm in the kitchen at Hill Center in Washington, D.C. with three historians who are going to add to the museum's discussion of warfare through a series of videos. My name is Julia Irwin and I'm an assistant professor of history at the University of South Florida. I specialize in U.S. foreign relations, American humanitarianism, and especially U.S. foreign relief during World War I. I'm Helen Veit. I'm an assistant professor of history at Michigan State University. I specialize in food in the World War I era, and I work on food history generally. I'm Amanda Moniz. I'm the assistant director of the National History Center of the American Historical Association. I'll be making some of the recipes from the World War I cookbooks. Americans had been affected by World War I before they even entered the fray. Is that right? Absolutely. Food aid to Europeans was one of the first major international food aid projects that Americans ever had. We often think about American entry into World War I starting in 1917, which is when the U.S. military entered the war. But the war itself had been going on since 1914, and Americans were involved in their kitchens. They were saving food to send to European soldiers and civilians. There was not a rationing system, but they were encouraged to voluntarily save their food to help European children and women and soldiers keep fighting. In fact, the war itself was hugely disruptive of agriculture in Europe. There were trains suddenly running through what had been farmlands. And one of the big stories is that millions of farmers left for the trenches to fight. So European agricultural production went way down and lots of people were going hungry. Yeah. So the United States became a major, uh, major supplier to the Allies, especially uh, to, to Britain and to France, supplying wheat for bread, supplying meat, sugar, these precious, precious sources of calories, fats as well. Americans were very humanitarian. American involvement of the, in the war is not just military involvement. Humanitarian involvement is a type of participation in the war. And wasn't this around the time of the Progressive Era? Absolutely. The Progressive Era was a time of big social reform in general in the United States. A time when all sorts of people became interested in the idea of positive social change, in the idea of progress. And food was one big way that people tried to make changes and to reform things. Once America actually entered World War I officially in 1917, the president, Woodrow Wilson, created a mandate to make a U.S. Food Administration, which was a temporary wartime agency that aimed explicitly to export as much food as possible to Western Europe, both to allies and also to U.S. soldiers at that point. And that started a huge conservation effort mm -hmm. around the country to try to get Americans to eat less of the products that they were trying to export. Wheat, beef, pork, sugar, and butter. And I think it's also important to point out it was a voluntary effort. So Herbert Hoover, who was the head of the American Food Administration, um, decided that he didn't want to make this a legal mandate. So Americans were very much voluntarily encouraged to save food, to conserve food. They had housewives sign pledges saying that they would voluntarily conserve food 
And by the Food Administration's reckoning, about 70% of American families did that. And I think it's important to remember that children, too, uh, were really encouraged to play a role in the schools. They were encouraged to make gardens and to save food themselves, to, to collect and donate food. So children themselves become involved in the war effort in really important ways. In the upcoming videos, we serve a meal of World War I recipes. We start with date salad and peanut butter soup, go on to soybean croquettes and cornmeal rolls, and finally, braised tongue and mandalay salad. Dessert, maple cake, a meal from soup to nuts. All right, so... Um, Starting, starting from there, uh, so this video project, um, it, it came to us, uh, Amanda Moniz and I happened to be talking one day at a conference uh, about a little less than a year ago, um, thinking about ways to get the public engaged with World War I. Uh, World War I centennial has, has now occurred, uh, World, the centennial of World War I is ongoing, um, but in the United States, uh, where U.S. military entry doesn't really begin, doesn't occur until 1917, uh, the war has not had as much of an impact uh, as some people would like for it to have. So we're thinking, you know, how do you get the public involved? Um, how, what makes people pay attention, be interested in food? Uh, food comes to mind. Um, food is a way that, that people can connect with these ideas, um, uh, can connect on a very personal level. And so we, we thought, um, essentially thought of these videos and, and um, moved forward uh, towards organizing them. We worked with American Food Roots, um, Bonnie Wolf. Um, we got involved with Laura Vogt at the uh, National World War I Museum uh, and, and created this series of videos. We're going to show you another one towards the end uh, that actually shows some of the cooking process. Um, but you can, Yeah, um, and so it was a really fun day where it was yeah. Julia and me and Amanda really in front of the camera. Um, kind of a whirlwind day with lots of cooking and talking and brainstorming. And American Food, American Food Roots has been doing the editing and putting these together since then. But one of our big hopes is that these will be um, potential, potentially useful for K through 12 teachers. Um, and they're sort of short, um, we hope, overviews of World War I food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so beyond sort of public engagement uh, with World War I, uh, yeah, as Helen said, we wanted to reach out to teachers. We wanted to make uh, things that, you know, children could see there four to five minutes um, and say, oh, this is, this is what's going on, or that you could show in a sort of uh, a, you know, classroom setting. Um, and another sort of point uh, that we really wanted to make is really to show a different narrative, a different perspective um, of, of World War I than is typically taught in textbooks. So World War I is not just about military and involvement. Uh, World War I affects every aspect of society. It affects the home front. It affects what people cook. It affects what people eat, what they put on their plates. Uh, and so this, you know, sort of uh, an ability to kind of tell this narrative through food, through these videos, was what kind of motivated it as well. So, so in other words, it's not just a sort of novelty entree into the subject, which I think it's, it's very valuable because I think students really do connect with food. It's fun. It's interesting. But beyond that, it's really important to understanding World War I. The, world, the food and food supplies crucially affected how World War I was run, how it was eventually won, and in turn, World War I dramatically changed how Americans especially, um, but in other countries too, how they ate, how they cooked, and how they thought about food. So a central argument is that you really can't understand either of these two subjects without looking at them both. Um, so that's one thing that we hope to achieve by, by these videos. Yeah, and, and just kind of... Uh Finishing off that too, the, the idea of, of humanitarian involvement is another form of involvement in the war. Uh, so wartime involvement is not just military commitment, it's not just on the dip diplomatic level, the military level, it's also through humanitarianism, through humanitarian assistance, uh, through saving food, through providing food, um, and so that's uh, these new perspectives we hope to, to kind of um, to talk about a little bit more and to encourage you guys to think about in, in your teaching. So. Um, do you want to sort of move on to the next? Yeah. Sure. So what we wanted to do, um, we both wanted to sort of share some new perspectives, some new ways of thinking about the war in a little bit more detail um, from our own research. Um, and we thought the kind of the best way to do this would be just a sort of a series of, of questions that we're posing to each other, so kind of a conversation. Um, and uh, feel free to, to ask questions, to jump in as, as we're talking as well. Uh, Helen is going to discuss uh, progressive era food history. Uh, her area of expertise, and then I will turn to sort of humanitarianism and World War I foreign relations uh, more generally, um, and two really do go together, uh, so, so don't think of them as, as divided topics, but um, so uh, we should start. Okay. Um, so, um, Helen, how did you, tell me how, tell us how you got interested in, in food history. <laughs> yeah. So I, Julia and I were actually in grad school at the same time, and I started out writing a dissertation 
that was very foreign policy focused, focused on diplomatic history and on food aid, a topic that no one had written about in depth yet, at least not the way I wanted to. Uh, but the more I got into this subject, I was seeing that as vital as World War I and food were to each other, so much about food was changing culturally. So the book that I eventually wrote, um, Modern Food, Moral Food, looks at food in World War I, but really looks more broadly at the modernization of food, how food became modern at this time period. Um, so I, I kind of got seduced, I would say, by the sources, which were so fabulously interesting and rich and funny. I'll be talking more about some of the amazing stories I found in the archives, but also how, how relevant I think a lot of those stories are to understanding the, the big, dry foreign policy political picture, which I had you know, initially gone in you know, thinking I should do out of duty, and, and kind of through a back door, I think ended up talking about anyway, but through, I think, a more fun, interesting lens. Sounds great. Could you give uh, maybe a little more general background on what's going on with, uh, with food, with World War I? Just to... Sure. So we just saw in the video some of the overview about food in the world, in the war. There were major food shortages during the war. Food was central to how both sides were fighting against each other. The German U-boat campaign was explicitly aimed to sink food imports to France or to Britain. Britain especially was crucially reliant on imports. It was an island nation that was not self-sufficient with food. At the same time, the Allied naval blockade of Germany was designed to do exactly the same thing, to stop imports of food to Germany. Both of these, in other words, were aimed to cause civilian hunger. And a lot of, you know, at the time, they weren't advertising that, but that was absolutely going on. That was, that was a reality. And Germans, the, the eventual capitulation of Germany was in large part because that worked, because their civilians became desperate for food by the end of the war. So on the home front, on the American home front, the US Food Administration that I talked about in the video, um, the, the big organization run by Herbert Hoover, was a massive organization. This was really big government in a way that Americans hadn't seen big government before. It was a 3,000 person bureaucracy. But I, I think the even more interesting story is that there were tens and hundreds of thousands of other people working for the Food Administration who weren't on staff, who were volunteers. Herbert Hoover had fully the power to impose rations if he wanted to. Congress had given him that power as head of the Food Administration. Hoover himself chose not to do that, at least because our involvement with the, with the war was so short. Had it lasted longer, we might have had rations during World War I. But he relied mainly on volunteerism and on propaganda. Um, so there's a huge amount of um, propaganda posters at the time that were designed to get people to voluntarily eat less butter, less beef, less pork, less white bread, now, to us, this sounds like, oh, the American Heart Association must have been involved. They, you know, they wanted Americans to eat less bacon. But it was actually the opposite. People at the time thought these foods were the most healthful, that these were the foods people should be eating for strength, for vitality, and thus those were the foods most needed by soldiers. So it was a, a benevolent action to go without those foods and to eat other foods instead, to eat um, corn and oats instead of, instead of uh, wheat flour, to eat fish or poultry instead of beef or pork. Great. So, I mean, kind of moving on that though, like, what are what are some of the other ways that American eating habits changed and cooking habits changed? I mean, how did that affect sort of how Americans really thought about food um, during the war? So that that's a that was a really big topic. That was sort of the thing that most that I got most pulled in with uh, during this was how how much about cooking and eating was changing at this time. One of the big changes that was happening was industrialization. The industrialization of food, um, things you know, more and more appearing in cans and boxes and bags under brand names. Um, by 19, by the end of the war, you know, I could list two dozen corporations to you: Pepsi and Coke and um, Nabisco, and I could go on and on. That all these corporations we recognize today were thriving by the World War One era. Agriculture was also being industrialized. These things were already happened, but the war accelerated them. And it made them patriotic. We might today think of you know, buying processed food as a sort of shortcut or maybe something you'd rather not do, but you need to do it. You're in a hurry. Back then, that was considered efficient, 
patriotic. That was considered you know, the best, most modern way to do it. So that was one big change, the industrialization of food. Another was that there was a huge push for nutrition education. The fact that the government could say to people, you know, don't eat you know, white bread, instead eat corn or oats, that was based on very new knowledge about nutrition. The fact that what you were eating wasn't just bread, but you were really eating carbohydrates. That was a new idea for people. Or the fact that instead of eating beef, you could eat not only chicken, but you could eat beans or nuts. 20 years ago, people had not thought that. They had not believed that. Um, I like to give a sort of snapshot of how much changed about nutrition at this time. In 1900, if you had taken two American meals, one, let's say, a sharecropper meal, a, a poor sharecropper's meal, with beans and greens and gravy and cornbread, and compared it to a Gilded Age restaurant meal with steak and asparagus and Bernays sauce and white rolls, virtually everyone would have said that the second meal, that restaurant meal, was the more healthful meal. You know, and so these, these were a world apart, not just in, in social terms, but in physical terms. Just 20 years later, by 1920, because of a revolution in nutrition science that was pushed by the war, people would have said, wow, you could actually say those meals are really equivalent. You know, you, the beans and the steak really equal each other. The asparagus and the greens, the gravy and the Bernays sauce, you know, those are fats, those are mm -hmm. vitamins. Vitamins themselves were a new discovery by nutrition scientists that World War I was crucial in pushing and in making what widely known. So were calories. Calories had just been applied to food energy in the very late 19th century. And they were crucial for, for World War I government officials to say, you know, make sure you're getting X amount of calories and also make sure you're not getting too much. And that was very new. When we think about calories today, we tend to think of them in a rather negative light. A nutritionist today might say, you know, if you have three extra teaspoons of sugar, you're going to have to walk an extra mile to burn those off. A nutritionist in World War I would have said, three lumps of sugar will give you the energy that you could walk an extra mile. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, a very different, <laughs> it's a very different way of conceiving of food energy. Um, but that, that too was changing. Um, and in fact, <laughs> increasingly what people said is that you can, you can physically look at someone and tell if they've been wasting food or not. Because wasting food increasingly meant not just throwing it away or, or not making good use of it. It could also mean eating it when you didn't need it, eating it when it wasn't physically necessary. <laughs> this was very new. The culture of thinness that we really see exploding into American culture at large by the 1920s um, really got a major push from World War I. Um, this idea that thin was beautiful, and also that thin said something about your character, that it indicated something about your ability for self-control, was so new. For, you know, for, for, for so many years, thinness and self-control had not seemed to be allied concepts. If you were thin in the past, it was much more likely because you, you were a hard worker, you worked you know, some manual physical job, or you were ill, or you were very poor. Um, and although you know, gluttony had long been condemned, this idea that, that self-control could be legible in someone's body was very new, and I think directly contributed to the explosion of the thin ideal by the 1920s, um, the idea that extreme thinness was really beautiful. And it was, in fact, a necessary prerequisite for beauty, um, which, we, which we have seen since then, really, in American culture. Um, and again, just, just, this is one thing I love to show um, to my students when I'm teaching about this subject. This just shows you know, that, that it wasn't you know, an all or nothing attitude, that you know, this was really a turning point. But a lot of people still really valued fat and robustness by the 1910s. On the left, you see Reginald looked like this, while well, a chef fed him caviar, filet mignon, pâté de foie gras. You may notice these are all these you know, foreign foods, French foods, decadent, you know, suspect French foods. But now that he gets plain baked beans and fresh air, he looks like this. He's 50 pounds heavier. And of course, he's wearing a US Army uniform. Um, so he's been transformed from this effete neurasthenic on the left to this um, you know, extremely hardy, vital, masculine figure on the right, as they would have seen it at the time. Um, so in general, 
this emphasis on self-control is one thing that I think was really um, a legacy of the war in many ways. Great, thanks. Um, are there any other sort of last tidbits? I know that Hel Helen's research has turned up some very um, strange stories, so maybe you could share a couple, a couple of the weirder parts. Uh, that okay. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, so I found lots. There were so many wonderful things. One of the, the things that I really got involved with um, that I spent a lot of time looking with at when I was doing my research were the letters that people during World War I wrote to the U.S. government. Um, about 350,000 people, even more actually, wrote to the government saying um, you know, all sorts of things about food during World War I. About the, the U.S. Food Administration got um, you know, something like 380,000 letters. So reading these is just a, a cornucopia of American culture at this time around food. And one thing that I kept seeing over and over, and that finally I realized, wow, this is a trend, was people talking about killing and eating their pets. Um, there was a huge push during World War I for alternative meats in general. Again, trying to send the beef and the pork to Europe. People talked openly in newspapers about eating porpoise or whale or turtle or snails or snakes or you know, horse meat, of course. Um, you know, any alternative meat you can think of they were talking about, but some people went further and said, you know, here we are, so many of us keeping cats and dogs, carnivores who themselves require meat. Um, this is enormously w wasteful, inefficient, unpatriotic, truly patriotic people will kill their pets and eat them. <laughs> and some people in fact did this. One government scientist had, he called them a series of cat feasts where he invited <laughs> friends over and he didn't, he was in DC, he didn't tell them what he was serving. He, he, said, he sometimes said it was beaver. He sometimes said it was rabbit. And he would serve them food. He, 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 he always got the cats by just finding alley cats. Once he served a purebred Angora, but it was usually alley cats. And then he would tell them. And this was an effort to be patriotic and to be efficient and to, and to sort of show how mature and how detached he was from the childish demands of pleasure or taboo or habit that other people might be stuck in, that he was more progressive than that. Um, he was joined by Harvey Wiley, who you may not have heard of, but he, in the progressive era, was an extremely famous scientist, probably the foremost expert on food in the country. He was the architect of the Pure Food and Drug Act. He strongly advocated doing this. Not many people did it. Few, few Americans actually ate their pets, but a lot of people killed them in the name of patriotism because they didn't want to keep a carnivore in their house, that this seemed, you know, this seemed wasteful to them. Um, so that was one, I think, extremely interesting tidbit. Another was how much the food that we think of as being normal, um, how disgusting so many foods were um, at the time, and how much tastes themselves changed. Um, a lot of the foods that I saw people really trying to get people to eat, that people didn't want to eat, that they thought was disgusting, included cottage cheese, this you know slimy, clumpy white stuff that people you know a, a byproduct of um, you know of other dairy production that people at first really rejected. Another that surged into popularity that had been widely reviled as this sticky, gritty, kind of nasty, unknown, you know suspect mass was peanut butter, <laughs> and that became hugely popular as a result of the war. Another was um, this kind of horse feed that some people made into a mush and ate, called oatmeal. <laughs> um, and the fourth was this uh, paste that some foreign people ate when it was dried and they boiled it, called pasta. Uh, and in, in fact, foreign foods in general got an enormous boost from the war effort. There had been widespread interest in foreign foods in earlier decades in, in US history. But especially in the progressive era, a lot of people said these are objectively disgusting. They're all these foreign foods. And you know, this was an extremely you know, limited way of looking at what foreign foods were, what counts as foreign. But, but, but as people then, as, as some people then saw it, um, you know, foreign foods were all mixed together. They were, stew, they were stews or soups or goulashes or casseroles. It was hard to digest. How could the body really know what it was getting when all the ingredients were mixed up? Um, but World War I government officials said, these are really good because they're meat stretching. You know, add a little bit of meat to a soup, it's a satisfying meal. And so they really pushed for foreign foods. And by the end of the war, um, you see pasta dishes, casseroles, goulashes, these same foods 
appearing all the time in mainstream U.S. cookbooks in a way that they hadn't been in earlier decades. All right. Uh, so anything else to add? or I think uh, Not for now, but I would, okay. I would love to, you know, I hope in the Q&A we can talk mm -hmm. um, more. So I wanted to ask Julia some questions, too. All right. Um, first of all, can you just talk about your research generally and your book? Yeah, so um, as Helen said, we were, we were in graduate school at the same time uh, and, and we're writing our dissertations at the same time. Um, my book, um, Making the World Safe, uh, is less directly about food than Helen's, but food is everywhere in my book. Um, so my book uh, focuses really on how and why. Uh, the U.S. government and its citizens um, came to uh, provide aid to, to the world uh, in the early 20th century, and then especially in Europe during World War I and its aftermath. Uh, on the one hand, I focus on uh, how, how during the war and its aftermath, really this moment of increasing U.S. global power uh, and, and sort of influence on the world stage, uh, this is a period in which the U.S. government realizes um, kind of for the first time the value of humanitarian aid as a tool of statecraft, as a tool of diplomacy, as a sort of way to win hearts and minds throughout the world. Um, but it's not just the government. At the same time, uh, the sort of cosmopolitan group of Americans, uh, American physicians, nurses, uh, social workers, uh, just everyday individuals, uh, but also uh, social scientific professionals, um, all of these people uh, came to take part in humanitarian aid and really to see it uh, as a way to participate in the international community in new ways, to sort of share ideas about medicine, to share ideas about science, uh, to provide assistance um, to the world. Um, finally, I look uh, sort of at how just ordinary, everyday Americans, um, you know, reacted to humanitarian aid, how they came to sort of see humanitarian aid as an important part of, of their lives, uh, giving, you know, giving a dollar, joining the Red Cross, uh, taking part in food drives, things like that, um, and sort of thinking about their connections uh, with the world and, and what they as Americans could do in the world. Um, my focus in this book uh, is really on the American Red Cross. Um, the American Red Cross at this time uh, was the dominant player uh, in American overseas aid and assistance throughout much of the war uh, and into its aftermath as well. Um, the organization hadn't really uh, had that much attention, uh, though, until I started researching it. Um, I really focus on the sort of significance of the American Red Cross, uh, its activities uh, to U.S. foreign relations, to U.S. international history, and to the social history of the United States at this time. Um, during World War I, which is really, again, the peak of the, the organization's involvement, um, the American Red Cross had something like 22 million adult members and 11 million child members. Uh, so 33 million, this is about a third of the U.S. population at the time. Uh, so just thinking about the sort of cultural significance of this organization, uh, it raised literally hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, this, this huge war fund, uh, to finance um, humanitarian efforts during the war. Uh, during the war and its aftermath, um, uh, tens of thousands of American men and women especially uh, served overseas. Uh, they served in over two dozen European nations. Uh, they were in Russia, they were in France, they were in Italy, they were in uh, the Near East uh, as well. Something like 19,877 nurses went abroad as, in a Red Cross uniform. Uh, and so thinking about these people's um, efforts in the war I think is really important. Um, thinking about the sort of ways uh, that the American Red Cross took part in the world. Um, but we can extend this too. It's not just the American Red Cross. Um, groups uh, such as the Commission for Relief in Belgium, which was one of Herbert Hoover's uh, early campaigns. Uh, groups like Near East Relief, which joined uh, missionaries who were already serving abroad. Um, groups like the American Relief Administration after the war, which was the U.S. government's first uh, official and formal governmental humanitarian aid program. Um, all of these organizations uh, joined the Red Cross and really uh, raised and distributed billions of dollars worth of food, uh, medical supplies, clothing, uh, and other aid for Europe, reconstruction assistance as well. Uh, this aid uh, affected millions of people. Uh, it affected millions of um, American and European soldiers, uh, but also European civilians, uh, civilian men, women, and children, again, from all parts um, of, of allied Europe during the war and um, the former central powers after the war. Uh, so this really had some major implications, as, as you can imagine, for Europe uh, and for the United States, really both at the time and in the century that followed. Uh, so I think kind of thinking about this humanitarian history um, is, is, you know, is an important component of the war uh, that we need to keep in mind. So, so, so how do people usually tell the story mm -hmm. of World War I? 
Yeah, and I think, you know, this is, this is kind of the question that we think about, you know, how does this affect teaching? Um, and I think, you know, when looking at textbooks, um, it depends, you know, if you're teaching a European or a world civ class, the war receives more attention in you know, 1914, the war starts, 1918 it ends, there's the, you know, discussion of the League of Nations, its aftermath. Um, so, you know, the war gets attention, but still, it's, it's focused often on the, the military campaigns, on the diplomacy, on the high politics, on what's, what's going on sort of uh, at that level. Uh, there's some attention to, to, uh, to home fronts, how they're affected, to how civilians are affected, but really the sort of the, the top-down approach is often kind of dominating. Um, in American history textbooks, we have even less. You know, World War I is, is kind of, um, it's, it's not the forgotten war, but it's certainly overshadowed by World War II. Um, by uh, you know the Civil War, so World War One kind of becomes this blip. Uh, people talk, you know, we have the Lusitania, and Americans get concerned, and then Woodrow Wilson debates entering, and all of a sudden, April 1917 comes. The United States is in the war, and 19 months later, the war is over, uh, and then there's this this League of Nations problem uh, that that uh, doesn't, uh, uh, you know obviously does not work. Uh, so these sort of diplomatic, political, sort of focusing on soldiers, focusing on politicians. I mean, these these become the sort of grand narrative. Uh, of the war, and then there's this sort of sense of a, re, a quick return to isolationism uh, on the part of the United States, uh, and this idea that all of a sudden by 1919 the United States has, has given up its internationalism, has become isolationist um, for the rest of the, you know, the, the interwar period. And so I think uh, this is an obviously simplifying to some extent, um, but, but many textbooks do sort of focus on that, you know, that is the short brief narrative um, of the war. So, so I guess the question is, how does your research yeah. change that? What are some new perspectives we get from your research on humanitarianism and the Red Cross about mm -hmm. World War One? Yeah, and I think you know, I, I, I can point to several. Um, I think first, um, you know. Focusing on humanitarianism, especially if you're thinking about a U.S. perspective, um, focusing on American humanitarianism really helps us reperiodize American involvement in the war. Um, seen through the lens of humanitarian involvement, um, U.S. participation in the conflict actually begins in September 1914. So a month after the war is broken out, the Red Cross sends its first relief ships to Europe. So you actually have aid going to Europe from the United States um, immediately after the war has broken out, and it will continue through uh, the period of, of official U.S. neutrality. Uh, it certainly explodes after the U.S. enters the war itself, um, but, but it really helps us kind of think about American involvement earlier. During this period of official neutrality, Americans are still involved through humanitarian assistance. Um, it also helps us reperiodize the ending of the war. You know, the, the war does not end in 1919 after the, the sort of or the first Senate vote against the League of Nations, or, or 1920 after the second vote. Um, it doesn't end in 1918 when, when the, the armistice is, is called in November. Um, we can see it ending uh, in 1923, um, which is when the last American Relief Administration um, personnel left Europe. Um, American relief workers were in Europe um, by, by the thousands um, through 1920, 21, 22, and into 1923 um, in a number of different countries providing mostly food aid, um, but also other forms of assistance, medical assistance, reconstruction assistance. So thinking about the sort of humanitarian involvement uh, really broadens our definition, I think, of intervention um, beyond just militarism, beyond just diplomacy, and really thinking about intervention in, in a different way. Humanitarianism is a type of intervention, and it helps us see American involvement in the, the war era um, being really a decade long. Um, I think a second, uh, second kind of important new perspective, um, it helps us think about the sort of legacies, um, legacies of this involvement. Helen mentioned uh, just the, the size of the bureaucracy of the Food Administration, and this, you know, this sort of growth of the U.S. federal government uh, during this period is really important, um, not just on the home front, but also in the field of foreign assistance. Um, and this really sparks a trend that is going to es escalate dramatically in the coming decades. Um, much of the aid that was provided to Europe um, was provided by private citizens and organizations, uh, again, like the Red Cross. Um, but uh, the U.S. government, U.S. diplomatic and military officials uh, really facilitated the efforts of, of private relief organizations, volunteers, in a lot of ways. Um, they, they helped sort of negotiate assistance. Um, they, they helped sort of deliver assistance. So thinking about that, uh, the government's involvement and association uh, with the private sphere in delivering aid is important. Um, the U.S. government itself, though, uh, through its Army Medical Department, uh, through its employment of Red Cross nurses, um, through the post-war uh, American Relief Administration, again, the first uh, you know, federal humanitarian program, uh, it's expanding its own humanitarian role enormously. 
Um, this, this increasing state involvement in, in foreign relief um, is, is a really important sort of um, beginning for the government. It's really um, by the Cold War period, by World War II and the Cold War, uh, we'll see the government embrace um, foreign aid as a tool of, of statecraft itself. Um, but it's a really crucial early chapter, I think, to think about um, American involvement here. Can I just add yeah. something, too? Mm -hmm. I think what Julia just said about aid as a tool of statecraft is really, really key. Mm -hmm. And in all this talk about humanitarianism, I think it's also important to remember that at least for the U.S. Food Administration, its involvement in food aid mm -hmm. wasn't just about humanitarianism. It wasn't just about feeding hungry children. It was about feeding some hungry children, mm -hmm. especially if they were French or British, but it was about explicitly also denying food to German children mm -hmm. or to Austrian children. It was, um, you know, it was definitely a tool of the military. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it was even more complicated than that because it wasn't even food aid in, in what we might think to our allies. It was loans. The allies went into deep debt during World War I to buy food from the United States. These, they, they were going into debt. And this was one major factor that made the US after the war so powerful, a creditor to the empires of Europe. After the war, Herbert Hoover not only returned the $150 million that Congress had given him to run the Food Administration, but he also turned over an extra $50 million in profit because he was charging high prices. And he said, you know, the US Food Administration cost the government over $50 million less than nothing. And I think that's important to remember <laughs> that this is aid, but it's complicated aid. Um, it's aid with, with real strings attached and only to certain people. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really great point. And kind of thinking about those those you know the the political and strategic aspects of, of food um, is is really important. Um, I think just one sort of one last sort of new perspective, and I think maybe in some ways um, um, perhaps the most important um, is really uh, it makes focusing on food, focusing on uh, food aid and humanitarianism. It helps us and helps students really think about. Uh, the war in new ways. The war is not just about soldiers fighting. It's not just about these sort of diplomats and policymakers who are making decisions. Uh, it brings in new actors, and especially women and children, uh, into the history of the First World War. Um, as I mentioned, sort of tens of thousands of American women and men um, spent time in Europe as relief workers, not just as soldiers. Um, many of these people served in areas where U.S. troops never deployed. Um, so we actually have Americans, um, and the American Red Cross was actually wearing American military uniforms. Uh, so we actually have people who look like they are American soldiers, but they're in fact uh, women and men, uh, in places like Serbia, um, in southern Italy, in, um, in the Near East, and in, in Civil War era Russia, um, sort of showing America's presence. Um, but we can study these people. We can see that Americans are in other places. They're not just in France uh, they're, or in the sort of Western Front. They are uh, throughout, throughout Europe. Uh, at the same time, uh, we can see that in the United States, um, people are taking part in the war effort through humanitarianism. Millions of American adults and children uh, supported these efforts. They volunteered their time, they donated money to humanitarian organizations, uh, and many, as we've been discussing today, simply did acts like conserving food or changing their eating and cooking habits um, in an effort to help win the war. Uh, so Americans, sort of of all stripes, really bought into the war effort through humanitarianism. And I think uh, these, these women, uh, these, these and, and male relief workers as well, but, but girls and boys, children, uh, really play an important part um, in, in this history. Um, and we need to sort of recognize that. It helps us have a more uh, a sort of a personal understanding of foreign relations. So U.S.-European relations are not just happening at the, at the top level, um, they're happening at the ground level. American relief workers are forging really, really tangible personal connections with, with millions of Europeans. Uh, these are the people who are, who are who they're touching, they're, they're soothing, they're, they're feeding, uh, they're providing medical aid to European men and women and children as well. Um, they're, they're taking part uh, in, these, in these relief efforts, and they're making these sort of personal connections. And I think, again, this helps us kind of rethink the, the, um, the, the uh, intimate nature, in some ways, of U.S. foreign relations. So, uh, yeah, or... Yeah. So can you talk any more about women or children's involvement? Yeah, and I think um, kind of uh, expanding a little bit more, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we can, we can focus on women and their social uh, role in the world. Uh, I think Helen did a really good job already sort of talking about women as, as um, you know, 
um, you know, being in some ways the sort of conservators of, of food, and you know, housewives especially. Um, this becomes you know, a housewife's duty. She, she is not going to be serving in the war alongside soldiers, but she can do her duty by making sure that her family follows things like meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays. And, and this is a way for women themselves to get involved in the war. Um, I mentioned the nurses who went abroad as well, um, but we can, we can study these women. We can study the women who worked for organizations like the YMCA. Um, these all give women a way to take part very actively, whether they're on the home front or going to Europe in the war effort. Um, and a final sort of uh, thing, and I think this, you know, for especially for K through 12 teaching, helps us to get students involved. We can really focus on what children were doing. Um, Helen already showed a few sort of the posters of the children who are involved in the war effort, um, but, but children really are. They're, um, they're involved in their schools. Um, one of the organizations that I study in my research was the Junior Red Cross. Uh, as I mentioned, it was 11 million children. This is half of the school age population uh, enrolled as Junior Red Cross members. Um, and during the war, this meant that they were taking part uh, mostly through their schools in relief activities. Uh, a lot of children in many cities throughout the country, cities and towns throughout the country uh, in, in the Junior Red Cross, they did things like planting school gardens, uh, they organized plays uh, they, uh, to, to raise money for the war effort. They, they um, uh, organized and, and bazaars, you know, they would, they would bring in uh, you know, items, you know, essentially garage sales from, uh, yard sales from their homes uh, to, to raise money for the war effort. Um, thinking of the way that children were getting involved and interested in the war effort, I think, is a really important component of this as well. And it's a way to kind of connect with students, show, you know, students during, uh, during World War I were taking a very active part in the war effort themselves. Um, so it wasn't just you know, wasn't just the the adults who who were involved. So, I think um, with that maybe I'll maybe I'll leave it off. Great. Do you want to add anything? Or? No, that's that's great. Okay, um, just to kind of close off, what we wanted to do uh, is just show one more of our of, of the videos that we actually began with. We we began with the introductory video, and we want to show you one of the content videos. Um, our hope in making these, there's, there are four content videos. Uh, there's, there's the sort of, you know, this is a meal from, from beginning to end. Um, and in each of these videos, uh, Helen and I, well, Amanda actually does the cooking, uh, and Helen and I sort of talk about the history, um, different historical aspects um, of, of the war. Um, and what we, in choosing the recipes, we kind of chose, tried to choose things that people could actually make at home. I mean, some of this is, you know, parents with their children, uh, but some of these things could even be adapted for, for you know, classroom use. Um, the, the, the second thing that we eat here could, you know, you could imagine sort of um, younger children at least, you know, rolling the dates, and then I don't know what the, the food health, the health good violations here, but, um, you know, you might, you know. Yeah. So again, these are uh, all recipes that are adapted for these World War One yeah. food. A lot of meat alternatives were suggested for World War I. And these two recipes use legumes and tree nuts. This was a time when it, they were really trying to save meat and get Americans to eat less beef and pork so that they could send it to Europe. The problem was that most Americans, or many Americans at least, believed that meat was essential to health. Uh, they didn't have a great understanding of protein, um, you know, that you could get protein from nuts or legumes. and this was the time when nutrition scientists were just starting to, to have a lot of authority and World War I served as a big form of nutrition education for Americans. However, peanut butter was getting more popular, in part because Southerners were growing more of it and growing less cotton, and marketing campaigns like the Beech Nut Company promoting peanut butter as a great food for school children. What else would peanuts have been used for? Well, it, in the World War I era, you know, as a meat substitute, they were used in things like peanut loaf, which would have been seen as a substitute for meatloaf. It's not that necessarily peanut butter was, was healthier than meat, but it had the same nutrients, had protein, had the fats. Um, and the idea was that meat should be saved for soldiers, especially strong men who needed to eat red meat. This was a real opportunity for nutrition scientists to talk about the fact that different foods contained nutritive components, that it wasn't just steak, but it was, it was proteins and fats, and you could get those same proteins and fats from eating lentils or nuts. And, and that was really new. It was a very new way of thinking about food as containing constituent elements. This is good. It, it does definitely challenge yeah. my sort of genre of soup because it's not particularly salty. It is quite sweet. And when did the peanut butter and jelly sandwich start? <laughs> <laughs> By the 1920s, I'm seeing a lot of references to it, both for school children and also as a recommended cheap, healthy lunch for workers. A lot of these cookbooks have recipes for cream cheese. Mm -hmm. Can anybody explain that? 
people really prioritize dairy at this point. Dairy was considered, especially cow's milk, was considered one of the most healthful foods, especially for children. So cream cheese was one vehicle for getting dairy into people, along with another new food that people were promoting, which was cottage cheese. Mm -hmm. Milk really was considered the perfect food by many progressive reformers, and they believed that it had the perfect balance of fats, proteins, and sugars. One thing that the mayonnaise would have signified to people at the time was a sort of high-class French connotation. They might have pronounced it mayonnaise um, if they were really highfalutin, because we think of it as sort of, you know, a very ordinary condiment, but at the time it would have really talked about French high cuisine to people. How is it? It's really good. The you're, it's actually nice. You're a genius. <laughs> I think it's kind of good. They're yeah. delicious. Well, this is the end of our first course in our soup to nuts meal. <laughs> actually, this is soup and nuts, but we'll, we'll come back to it. So thank you all. I was going to say, well, well, I think we'll, we'll close off there and turn it to Q&A. We just wanted to say, the, so these videos are, um, again, they were um, sponsored by the National World War I Museum and by American Food Roots, but they're accessible through the AHA's website, um, and they're also accessible through the uh, World War I Museum's um, uh, Warfare exhibit, which is um, a really great sort of uh, collection of primary resources um, about food, um, food and the war, essentially. Um, and if you'd like to add anything else. No, that's yeah. great. We so, welcome your questions. Yeah, so thanks. <laughs> I enjoyed both of your talks. I plan on getting both of your books for Thanks. my work. Uh, I study the Roosevelts a lot, mm -hmm. and um, they, although in World War II they were involved with the Red Cross, mm -hmm. they were more involved with the YMCA, mm -hmm. and the YMCA now is so far from where it was 100 years ago. So could you speak to the differences that you found between the YMCA and the Red Cross and World War I, why you went more with the Red Cross? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so the Red Cross, um, it's, it's trying, to, trying to tell it quickly, uh, the Red Cross is actually a quasi-governmental organization um, at this time and ever since. It's recognized by both the Geneva Convention and congressional charters as what is called the Official Volunteer Aid Organization of the United States. So that's a strange concept, right? The Official Volunteer. Um, the Red Cross, though, is this kind of recognized, as, well, especially during World War I, by the Woodrow Wilson administration as being uh, the U.S. government's uh, sort of chosen instrument, its principal instrument of foreign assistance. And this means that the Red Cross um, gets, gets priority, essentially. It becomes, uh, gets priority um, on the war front. It, the, the Red Cross volunteers are the ones who get to wear the military uniform. Um, they are the ones who sort of get um, uh, uh, preference through the State Department. They are the ones who are promoted. Woodrow Wilson actually tells Americans that they should give their money to the Red Cross. He encourages other organizations, including the YMCA, to, um, to sort of support the Red Cross as the, the umbrella organization. That being said, the YMCA also plays a huge role. Um, most of its volunteers were involved um, they were in, in providing um, uh, sort of recreational activities um, for, for soldiers, uh, and, and American soldiers especially. So they were involved in, in um, sort of um, uh, providing you know, donuts and coffee to, to soldiers. Um, many of them set up recreation centers uh, in Europe. And the idea, the, the YMCA is, as a Christian organization was actually much more uh, focused on promoting men's morals uh, than the Red Cross was. So, so they wanted to, you know, they set up these rec centers where men could play baseball and write letters rather than going to visit prostitutes and get drunk. Uh, that was really the YMCA's mission in, in some ways, in, in a nutshell. Uh, not, not, that's, you know, summarizing a little too much, but. Uh, the Red Cross, though, actually, you know, it's, it, it, many of its members were obviously Protestant Americans, but the Red Cross often consciously defined itself as this more sort of secular aid organization, and I often see sort of my Red Cross workers making fun of the YMCA people as being too churchy and vice versa. The YMCA sees the Red Cross as, you know, sort of taking over where, the, where they, you know, where they belong. So um, there are these, you know, interesting differences there, but I think, you know, really it comes down to which one the government recognized and the Red Cross served as this quasi-governmental aid organization. So good question. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you very much um, for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I do have a question. Um, in your research, um, what, what did you find about the perception of Europeans to the food assistance, in particular uh, France and women in particular because of their looking at food not being able to provide for their own mm -hmm. families? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think you know the the experience of war for Europeans was you know was was devastating, especially for people in areas where there just wasn't enough food. Um, and, and I should say that the U.S. government talked a lot about the starvation of the Allies, and the Allies weren't starving, but there were places where Western food shipments were the only bulwark against starvation. Um, you know, in some in some areas, in other words, it was it was really dire the food situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think for many of those people. You know, it did involve maybe some sort of geopolitical shifting in, in their, you know, sense of the U.S. as this upstart who was, in fact, providing. I think, honestly, there was a lot of legitimate gratitude mm -hmm. towards the U.S. Um, I think there were, you know, especially in Belgium, which was, you know, the earliest and, and the most consistent recipient of aid. Um, you know, I think people were sincerely grateful. This, this was really a new idea, too, mm -hmm. the idea of food aid. Um, I also don't think, however, that... It was this sort of, um, you know, revolution in people's thinking about, you know, how 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 could mere, you know, little America over there provision us? You know, I, I think it, you know, I think most people who were getting aid were probably people who before the war were were, you know, relatively poor farmers who who you know were just grateful to have it. Yeah, and I think kind of adding to that, you know, it's food is complex, and it's again, it's a very personal issue. And I think your your you know point about, you know, is this offensive to to French women who you know are providing for the food. So Helen mentioned that there is real gratitude, and I think that's true on the one hand. And the U.S. government recognizes this is, this is true, that, that aid, as I mentioned, is a way to win people's hearts and minds and, and stomachs, essentially, um, by providing food to hungry people. And there is a lot of gratitude. There's a lot of support. Um, at the same time, you see in the records, uh, there are definitely moments of tension um, between aid recipients and aid workers. Um, you know, when, when aid workers want to sort of control the distribution of aid, people complaining about you know, their rations not being distributed fairly. Um, there are definitely concerns about uh, what types of food to be shipped. Um, and you know, certain, uh, for example, you know, shipping, um, shipping cornmeal, they kind of quickly realized didn't work because the corn would rot. And some people, many people did not know how to cook corn, what to do with corn, what to, what to do with cornmeal. Um, so sort of, um, you know, in some cases, relief workers recognize the need to be culturally sensitive and work with communities. In less uh, successful cases, they didn't and tensions certainly did arise um, over those issues, so. Thank you. Thank you. Just wondering, uh, with the European countries having these massive uh, colonial empires, mm -hmm. how did this, the sit food situation in Europe affect the overseas colonies and whether or not any of this aid was extended to them? And yeah. Yeah. did it alter the policy of this cash crop economies in the, in the colonies? Right. That is a fabulous question. And I think the, the answer, um, unfortunately, is uh, not to, to a very large extent. I mean, this aid was going to European countries. It was going, well, to, to a very small extent to the Near East, um, which would quickly become you know, European mandates under the League of Nations. Um, but there is very little talk and discussion about what's going on in the colonies, despite the fact that the colonists are, are uh, the, the colonized people um, are, are fighting in the war um, for, for the great powers. Um, you know, I, I really see policymakers paying very, very little attention to what is going on in, say, India and in, you know, North Africa and then, you know, French, British, Algeria, you know, the colonies. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. Have you, yeah? So. No, I, no, it's the same, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, and so. so it's, do we know whether or not those uh, mm -hmm. colonies were suffering through famine or lack of food or Production. Yes. Uh, well, uh, you know, I can't speak to food production, but certainly, uh, certainly suffering, you know, certainly not getting these sort of forms of assistance. I would expect that some of these soldiers who were serving um, would have been recipients of, of American relief. I can't say that for sure, but I would expect that ser soldiers who were serving in Europe would have been <laughs> beneficiary, but certainly the civilians who were affected. And you know, if we, if we think about colonies as being, you know, at this point, colonies are supposed to be providing food for the great powers. And so certainly, uh, you know, that, you know, that hasn't changed and there's no sort of assistance going that way. That's a really, really good question. And there was, just as an example, mm -hmm. a famine going on yep. in Persia at this time. And Persian officials contacted the U.S. and said, we need aid, our people are desperate, our people mm -hmm. are hungry. And the U.S. government said, no, you know, we, we've got to send it to Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just as sort of hi highlighting how much this really was a tool of war, mm -hmm. food aid. Yeah. And then where priorities lie. I think, I mean, and that points to this really, you know, humanitarianism becomes 
you know, people choose, you know, they prioritize, right? And so the priority is to win the war, um, especially, and then to, to stabilize Europe in its aftermath. And this is definitely the priority of policymakers and, and you know, many of the relief officials as well. So. Thanks, guys. Um, I had a question uh, about sources. Um, I think a lot of us probably have students who do research papers or projects, and I know you guys have done a lot of archival work all, basically all over the world, but are there accessible either books that have been published or online sources that we can point our students to mm -hmm. or even ourselves to for sort of classroom activities that could use primary sources? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I think a good place to start is the warfare exhibit at the World War I Museum, which has some great primary sources online. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of like a, a single online digital collection yet um, that I know of. Certainly, you know, you could do the regular things looking in newspapers and things like that. Um, but I don't know of one yet. Well, I think uh, one of the things I was going to suggest, um, so the cookbook that we have up there, that is that is digitized online. Archive.org has a lot of digitized war materials, um, cookbooks, things like that. Um, the Red Cross published lots and lots of manuals, pamphlets, and those are actually accessible at archive.org. Um, posters are a simple way to sort of show um, propaganda efforts to show the way that food is being depicted um, that, that you know, and Helen already showed a lot, but these are actually very sort of accessible and, and um, a lot of them are through the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, the Library of Congress's digital image collection actually has a lot of, of posters that are um, good to look at too. So. Yeah. very much. I find this very interesting. Um, does your research ever, I, I know this is the, uh, a, the um, American Historical Association, but does it develop, uh, talk about the development of food um, for growth and export in Latin America, like Argentina at the time, and, and, and maybe how uh, this would transition well into the Great Depression and mm -hmm. problems with that? Mm -hmm. A little bit. I mean, I work, I work mainly on the U.S. for this project, but Americans were increasingly involved with, you know, a globalized network of food, you know, including very much from Latin America and South America, um, and imports of wheat from those, from those countries and places was becoming important. I think the agricultural modes of production the, the industrialized agriculture that became a necessity during World War I, you know, plowing the prairies as far as you could, maximizing production at all costs, themselves were, were certainly a factor in the dust bowls that were part of the Great Depression. A lot of people point to the, the mass industrialization of agriculture as a big factor in that. Great, well, thank you, uh, Julia and Helen. That was thank you. fantastic. Um, so now I would like to recognize Wendy Egan, Tim Bailey, and Amanda Moniz, who will talk about Food Will Win the War, Approaches for Teaching World War One. Yeah. We can do the, yeah, this might be. Should we move that one? Can you hear me? It's on now? Okay, sorry. Good morning to all of you. Um, since this is the K-12 workshop, I'm curious about the audience. How many of you actually teach World War I to K-12 students? Great, how many of you teach it from the framework of U.S. history, European history, world history? How many of you teach it from more than one dimension, let's say? Okay, that's been my experience, too. I teach in a high school outside of Washington, D.C., in Bethesda, and I've taught AP Euro, AP U.S., and now I'm teaching AP World. So the way we frame it is going to be different for each of us. I've prepared um, two handouts. If you didn't get one, there's plenty up front. Come on up and get one, a white one and a gold one. Okay? Um, I'm just going to read a little introduction. It's on the back of the packet. Here we go. 
If you're anything like me in my school system, I spent the 10 days before break with no access to the internet, <laughs> with no printer. 10 days we had no access to the internet or the printer. I'm going to introduce Laura in a minute. But um, sometimes you have to go paper, OK? <laughs> Which uh, I brought up from uh, DC. In 2003, I started writing a column for World History Connected entitled Letting Our Students See the Past for Themselves, which was concerned with the use of images in world history in the classroom. I quoted Thomas Cahill in one column after reading one of his books. When he was a child, Thomas Cahill visited the Metropolitan Museum of Art. By the way, I went yesterday. Don't miss it. There's five great exhibits for all of us that teach history. You get a discount with your badge. Right. That's right. Only I didn't have my badge yesterday. Um, Cahill saw an accurate model of the Parthenon with this exciting and boldly colored frieze of gods and heroes. Cahill at once understood that the ancient Greece had not been a collection of tasteful white marble statues but a place on fire with color. Though Cahill's Jesuit teachers capably taught the classics, their methods were verbal, not visual. At the Met, Cahill connected these astonishing figures that now lived along Fifth Avenue and the brilliant colors of Homer's metaphors. This morning, I'm here to share with you one approach to using these amazing images that we've just seen from the presentation and the videos. Um, there are many ways to do this, and you all have your own. But the one practice I want to share with you um, comes largely from the AP World collection of thematic uh, approaches so that students can begin to analyze thematically. And that's on that um, gold sheet. It's simply a chart of the different themes that we use to teach AP World that I've put into a format you can use in the classroom. Um, Dana, would you mind bringing me back one of the gold sheets? Oh, here's one. Never mind. OK, thanks. Um, OK. I encourage students to see the past for themselves by requiring them. And we all know sometimes you have to require. Um, to apply the same themes and skills we use for the analysis of textual materials. It might be called close reading of the visual, to borrow Sam Weinberg's term. Images can provide primary source evidence with multiple points of view, assist students in developing questions, and constructing arguments. <clears throat> Excuse me. Facilitate practice in gathering and evaluating sources, and inspire students to arrive at conclusions regarding the past. These analytical skills involve contextualization, cause and effect, comparing similarities and differences, interpretation, and recognizing changes and continuities over time, among others. We all know students very often skip the images in their textbooks or simply read the caption beneath. They rarely examine them without guidance, but once they understand that they should read images as carefully and as closely as they do assigned written primary sources, they begin to understand the visual materials, let them see what happened in the past for themselves. I teach students to look for visual evidence of historical themes when using images in the same way we look for them when they read words. They should look at the environmental, and geographic features in a photograph for clues as to the impact that had on the historical event. What indications of social status or political affiliations are displayed? What cultural symbols are present in an architectural structure? What economic forces um, are at work in the image? Is there evidence of a gender role or expectation to be found within the image? How does painting or sculpture reflect the culture of the creator? Why do people revolt or resist against political or economic authority? 
These are the types of thematic questions that can be applied to these great images that we've seen this morning. So what I did for this presentation was to use the World War I Museum. And um, I put together a set of images. I have many more that I'm going to have Laura talk about at the uh, end. So I'm just going to walk you through what I put together as a little collection for you to see the amazing resources. On the front of the packet, I gave you the um, website. And the images that I've taken today are from the interactive timeline, which is a remarkable <laughs> resource. And there's an online database as well. The man who was asking about resources, I think, actually um, was going to this question. Is he still here? I think he kind of left. Anyway, oh, there you are. OK, so here are the resources. Um, and at the bottom, Laura's going to talk about warfare, which is an online, digitized, um, wonderful part of the collection there. So what do I have here? OK, so let's look at this gold sheet. The gold sheet is simply, as I said, the wonderful framework for analysis from the AP World Course. The very first theme is the relationship between man and the environment. And that goes to demography, disease. It fits in very well with food. Where do you grow all these foods? I have to say, I will never hear the phrase cat's paw again and not think of you all. Um, migration, paddles, patterns of settlement, technology. What is the technology that produced this food is a really interesting question, whether it's in feeding the colonial soldiers, which we really focus on in, in world history, or whether it's the economic plight of these people who were eating a more healthy diet, even though we thought it was less healthy at the time. The second theme is um, the development and interaction of cultures. Um, state building, expansion, and conflict. Too often, I think, as you were mentioning, these textbooks take the purely political approach to explaining warfare. There's more, I think, recently on the home front than there used to be. But it's still pretty political um, <laughs> narrative. The creation, expansion, and interaction of economic systems, we've heard about that. And then the social aspect. I'm very struck by what you mentioned about children, because I find, and I'd be interested to hear from some of you who teach, my students are so interested when I talk about kids in history. They're really, really interested in that. And when you think about the outbreak of World War I, it was the murder of two parents. And then later in the war, an entire family was eradicated in Russia. So there's this whole social element um, that is really interesting in terms of feeding children. And the women in Europe who were not able to provide food for their families are contained, some of their plight is contained in this set of images. So I went through this extensive collection, and I put together a few, and I'm just going to walk you through it. What I would do would be to give these images, and I have a Promethean board <laughs> when it works, in the classroom so I can project it <laughs> on there. But I'm telling you, right before break, and we have exams when we go back, nobody had access to the internet. So sometimes your best, we all know this, your best laid plans, <laughs> you can't do what you want. So here's a great poster. Um, this is from the US Food Administration inside your packet. Feed a fighter. Eat only what you need. Waste nothing, which goes along with your themes. That he and his family may have enough. On the next page, a great image of um, a uh, woman holding two loaves of bread. Women of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps making bread for British troops in France. On the next page, a poster, um, Save the Nation's Bread, so kids can contextualize these military or political posters through the prism of social or environmental factors. On the next page, Canada, who I think we all forget way too often, 
in our curricula. Um, Canada's butter opportunity. This is a great way for um, kids to actually use statistical analysis when thinking about food. On the next page, this appeal to um, Poland in terms of food economy, which of course is an um, echo or legacy of, of the revolution. Look with the uh, nationalistic appeal um, there. Then on the next pages, I've paired images rather than show us uh, just one image. And you have three textual images in one photograph about Serbia declare, I mean Austria-Hungary declaring war in Serbia, Wilson delivering his war message, and then Lenin arriving in Petrograd. On the next page, you see two families that were affected, um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and then of course the Bolshevik family. On the next page, this is strictly about rationing, the pairing of two images, bread rationing introduced in Germany, as well as Constantinople. So for those of us who teach world history, we have to globalize these um, notions of how people are being fed or rationed. And it goes on. I'm not gonna walk you through every one of these um, images. But what I would have um, the students do is to sit together, look at these images, and then develop questions about the images using the themes. And get them to pull from the themes questions that would lead to inquiry, and then hopefully more research using this great resource. So I'm going to conclude um, by having Laura stand up and talk about the um, Great Warfare part of the... Good morning, my name is Laura Vogt. I'm the Curator of Education at the National World War I Museum. Uh, and it has been an honor to work with all of these folks for I think the last year plus. About two years ago or more, uh, we started a digital exhibition, a, a new schedule for digital, digital exhibitions. Uh, with a new website, we could do a lot more um, robust and interactive things. And uh, fortunately, we have a new CEO. His name is Dr. Matt Naylor, and I uh, was talking with him and said, you know what? Everybody's really excited about food. Everybody really likes food and talking about that with World War I because people will, I don't know if that's true for you all, as historians, when you go to happy hour or the like, they ask you what you do and then you have to find some sort of common bond. And naturally I found myself drawn to food and talking about that. Um, at the, uh, our first digital exhibition that we rolled out uh, is called Warfare. Uh, it is uh, from the home fronts to the front lines, an exploration, a culinary exploration of World War I. It really has two parts to it. It uses all of the National World War I Museum's resources. Uh, the first, which Helen has up for us here, is actually the cookbook, that one of the cookbooks that you could be going through. That peanut butter soup uh, that Bonnie was using is actually something we've been doing for about four years at the National World War I Museum. And I'm going to quiz you all because you've been sitting for a little while. Quick question. Where is your National World War I Memorial and Museum? Bonus points right there and right there. Uh, absolutely right. <laughs> and in Kansas City, we actually are the second oldest collecting institution in the world. We hold uh, the most globally diverse uh, collection, uh, less than 10%. If you have been, on, less than 10% of our collection is actually uh, on display, but over 20,000 uh, images, to the gentleman who asked the question earlier, over 20,000 images are up online right now in a searchable database. And my teachers, uh, please just email education at theworldwar.org if you want free access to those without the uh, watermark on it. We want to get this information out. Um, it's brilliant. Wendy, I'm so excited to see what you've been doing. Um, it's brilliant to have worked on something three years ago with this interactive timeline and then to see um, what, what amazing expert teachers are doing around the nation with it. Uh, you can go online and you can uh, take a look at any of these uh, recipes. I highly suggest actually the white bean stew is a great one for kids to work with. 
there's also one for a biscuit that's pretty easy that we uh, would really encourage folks to be uh, teaching with. There's a gentleman out in Berkeley. Uh, his name is Richard Silberg. Uh, he was one of our National World War I Museum teacher fellows this year. He just completed our unit, which is going to be going up uh, on our website, theworldwar.org, and also uh, all the places that Amanda is like webmaster, um, that we will be providing a, a unit that allows uh, English language learners uh, to engage in this, and uh, we'll be using food to kind of teach English language. Uh, the other part that I wanted to show, if you don't mind, uh, might be the, yeah, if you'll actually head down to the bottom part, recipes. We had some lovely, um, we had some lovely food bloggers in Vancouver who actually um, went through and helped update. So if your kids have a hard time understanding what they actually, um, yeah, uh, what some of those recipes actually mean, uh, they had a hard time understanding what some of the actual ingredients were. Um, so feel free, you can go through on the bottom section there. Um, the buckwheat chocolate cake is really good. Totally suggest it. Uh, and then if you go over to the top, uh, the war section, uh, it actually provides a timeline. Um, it is a truncated timeline from the one uh, that the information comes from. It also has music. That is World War I relevant. It's all about the true learning. We want the kinesthetic learners. We want the audio. I mean, all of them. All of them. Former classroom teachers. Yeah, you know, what are you going to do with them? Uh, with that, if there are any questions about the museum or ways that we can help, and truly, with this room and all of you interested in teaching World War I, I need your help. Uh, we are the nation's uh, resource on many of these things. Any information you can give me about what you need really helps me and our other educator, uh, Cherie Kelly, provide better resources for you. February 1, we've got more lesson plans, and I think I've just used up about five minutes. So I'm going to pass this along. Wendy, thank you so much. Thank you. So, Amanda? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you? That was lukewarm, okay. Um, yeah, I know, well, we've been sitting for a while. Uh, so, um, my name's Tim Bailey, I'm the Director of Education for the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. How many of you use our resources now? Wonderful. Um, and how many of you have used our Teaching Literacy Through History curriculum that we have online available? <laughs> Not enough. Okay, so. Um, so let me, let me uh, uh, very shortly tell you what the uh, uh, teaching literacy to history was a uh, response, a uh, direct response actually, um, to requests we had from teachers on the, when the common core state standards were introduced. And um, how, now what are we going to do? Uh, our history, history teachers are at being asked to uh, use literacy in their classrooms and so on. Can you help us out with that? So we developed an, a curriculum uh, that was an integration of English language arts skills, literacy skills, that were, teachers were being asked to uh, address, along with the uh, history content that we know and love and that we want, uh, we, we need uh, to be teaching in our classrooms. And how that, that how do we blend those two uh, seamlessly? And so uh, these, um, these lesson plans that we developed are K-12, they cover all 10 uh, periods of American history, well, all nine in the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, AP standards are all 10 if you're looking at the Library of Congress. Uh, anyway, but we have uh, <laughs> cover all the periods. And the idea behind them is that you can teach great history using great literacy skills and get helping your students master those literacy skills that are going to open up the, uh, their own ability <laughs> to learn. So what we're, the, the goal of the, of the program is to teach students how to teach themselves and become independent learners. That you can give them a complex piece of uh, text, bless you. Uh, you can, you can use, get, hand a student a complex piece of primary source material and have them read it for themselves without you having to interpret it for them, without having a textbook have to, to interpret it for them, that they can then take that and interpret it for themselves. So, today what we're going to do is we're going to very quickly go through just a part of one of those uh, lessons. So, if you picked up um, this piece here, 
There are two things that we have. This one says Foodal in the War in 1917. And this one that says World War I posters in the collection of the Library of Congress here. We're going to be looking at both of those. Um, they're on that back table back there if you didn't grab one. And I'm actually going to put you to work. Uh, so, you know, none of this passive sitting and listening. Um, so, this piece here um, has, a, has a short introduction and some, uh, some discussion questions at the bottom. That's fairly standard. We're actually not going to really use that much. That's just for your background information. What we're actually going to do is take a look at what I would do in my classroom with my students. And that's this. Oh, by the way, if you, uh, on your way out, or if you've already got it, um, this poster um, here is, uh, is on the back table. Uh, please take one with you when you leave. Um, this is from our, uh, the Gilder Lehrman collection. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Gilder Lehrman has a collection of right around 65,000 primary source documents in American history. A very large uh, uh, part of that collection are images, and this is, uh, this is one of the ones that we, uh, that we have in our collection uh, that we've made into a poster, which, um, which we're going to be using to, uh, for this lesson today. So, here we go. This page here. We're going to start with this. When working with your students, um, one of the things that we want to do is we want students to, of course, cri um, become critical thinkers for themselves without giving them too much. Uh, and so what you really want to do is you want to lay the foundation and you want to, you want to teach the students up to the point of introducing, say, this image. So this is not done cold, right? I mean, you've been teaching a unit on, let's say, uh, leading into World War I. Um, or it could be even on the progressive era, right, leading into World War I. And what you, so, so you've laid that groundwork. But what you don't want to do for the students is give them so much information that they're unable to discern for themselves what something means, either a piece of text or an image. Um, think of it this way. If, let's say that you're going to be teaching I don't know, let's say we were teaching the Gettysburg Address, and you, you lay the groundwork, you've taught, the, you've taught hi your history curriculum up to that point of the Gettysburg Address being delivered. You tell them that, that, you know, here's Lincoln standing there, it's a cold November day, it's kind of drizzly rain, the guy who talks in front of him drones on for a couple hours, and Lincoln stands up and everybody's expectantly waiting for what he says. Two minutes later he's done, everybody's like, what? <laughs> that's it, you got two minutes, right? All these, right? that's all you got for me. But you explained to your students, people really didn't understand what he was trying to say, this is what, he, what the theme was, this is what the Gettysburg Address was trying, to, you know, was getting at, yada, yada, yada. And then you give them the Gettysburg Address. What's the problem with that? What have you already done for your students? Yeah, if you ask them to write about the Gettysburg Address, what are you going to get back? Yeah, exactly what you said, right? And you're going to feel brilliant. Right? Wow, they obviously understood exactly what Lincoln was had to say. No, they understood what you had to say about what Lincoln had to say. So the idea is to lay the ground for work for the student, but let the student draw out the meaning. So that's what this, this activity is trying to do. So let's take a look at this. Introduction. Um, during World War I, the impact of the poster as a means of communication was greater than at any other time during history. The ability of posters to inspire, inform, and persuade combined with vibrant design trends in many of the participating countries to produce thousands of interesting visual works. As a valuable historical research, uh, research resource, the, the posters provided multiple points of view for understanding the global conflict. As artistic works, the posters range in style from being graphically vibrant works by well-known designers <coughs> to anonymous broadsides Predominantly text. Okay, I'm not going to read all this because if you turn the next page, this is what your students would have in front of them. They wouldn't have that piece I just gave you. They would have this. Because if you look at that first text box, what's in that first text box? Right, it's exactly right. It's, the, it's what I just read. Now, what you want your students to do is, now this is of course a secondary, right? This isn't primary. There are times, you know, people say, oh, you have to teach with primary sources all the time. Yes, I agree. Primary sources are it, right? That's the thing. However, 
we live in a real world where you got to go from A to B relatively quickly in some cases, right? And so a, a good secondary source is, is a way to make that happen. But that doesn't mean you don't have to use the, do the skill work with your students. Right? You can actually teach them how to pull good meaning out of secondary materials as well as primary materials. So that's what we're doing with this piece. So if you go ahead and take a look at that. So I just read that piece. Now next to it, in the, the box to the, uh, the right of that it says, using specific examples from the text explain the purpose of World War I posters and why posters were effective. That's what you're out trying to get your students to do, is discern from that chunk Pull out the, the, right, now, here's the thing. And this is, this is where it make, it's different now than it used to be. In doing that, one of the things I'm gonna tell the students is, you have to cite where you're getting that evidence from, right? What is the textual evidence for your conclusion? That's the difference, that's the big difference, is that the student has to prove why their answer is, uh, makes sense to them. And so, and so, and that's the, that's the caveat. So as you go through this with them, you're saying, yeah, draw your conclusion, but now show me the evidence. What is your evidence for, draw, for that conclusion you just, you, you, you've come to? So if you go through this, you'll notice that there are uh, these de text boxes that take them through those. There are different questions that they would answer. Same idea through all of them, though. And again, they have to have textual evidence for whatever conclusion that they, that they draw. Now, Here's the part where I'm gonna put you to a little bit of work, and that's on actually analyzing uh, a visual. So, all of you have this poster, right? You've either got, this, the, you got the small one here, right? The big one's back there, like I said, make sure you take one with you, and a calendar. Um, so, often, and this was mentioned before, right? Often students glaze over, right, pictures, right, uh, images. One thing that happens is that students have been taught to take a look, and, and, this, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody. I tell them, take a look at that and tell me what it means. The student doesn't even see it. They're looking for the words, they're looking for a thing that tells them what it is, but they really aren't looking at it. So the first thing I do when I have, a, have my students take a look at an image like this, is I stand at the, my whiteboard and I tell them, Break it down for me. Tell me everything you see. Everything you see. Don't tell me what it means. I don't care right now. Tell me what you see. Because the person who created this, and that includes a photograph. Photographs are created, right? Through the, through the eye of whoever's taking that photograph, took that for a purpose. Tell me what you see. And so they start, you know, the sort of soon they get the, the hang of it. They start, we, and we start making a list. I see, all right, so tell me what you see. What do you see? Come on, come on, give me a rainbow. A red, rainbow. White, and blue. There you go. Ooh, nice. A red, white, and blue rainbow. Nice. Okay, what else? Statue of Liberty. A couple more. Man shooting a gun. Ah, man shooting a gun. Gloria sees a man shooting a gun. <laughs> There's a ship. What is man? Oh, the prow of the ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. You got I you know you know what one of my kids saw? There's a guy stealing that lady's bread. <laughs> okay? So so you get right, you really get them to look at it. That's the first step. Really get them to look at it. And point and you know, because there are subtleties you want them to be able to to find, right? So you have them go through every single thing that they can pick out. Now we go to this analyzing the poster, all right? So here's this thing here. So the first thing is give the, ti give the, uh, give the poster a title. Now this one kind of has an obvious title to it, but many that, that you'll see don't, right? And so you want the students to be able to pull from this. Now we've done this, right? We've done a real close, I mean, I guess you could call it a close read, right, of the poster. Uh, now what we want to do is we now we want to get, okay, so now from this, cre this thing we've done, what would you call this thing? What would you call this poster? And this one, you know, most people would say, oh, it's going to be called Food Will Win the War. Or another, somebody might also say, oh, it, it means, it, I, I would call it Waste Nothing, right? Or, or whatever. But you want them to come up with what, what title would you give this? 
Um, often, though, it's funny. Often, I'll take that piece and save it to last. Because we'll actually, we'll do the analysis of the poster and then go back to what you would call it. Because sometimes that changes. Because after they really take a good look at it and do these next steps, they say, oh, wait, I would change what I would call that just because of you know, how we've looked at it. So anyway, so next thing. What is the significance of the central figure or figures or objects? So first of all, you've got to pick out what, are the, what's the, what would you say is the central figures or objects in this, in this uh, poster? How many people would say Statue of Liberty is a central object? A few. Somebody give me something else then. Okay, people down in the corner. All right. Okay. The guy stealing the bread. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you have the students. Where are you focusing? Right. You want them to know where the students are focusing. Now, the one thing about image interpretation is, it gets a little iffy on right and wrong answers. Since, it's inter since somebody's interpreting something, you can have more right and more wrongish, right? I mean, but you really you want to leave the students free to, to pull out the meaning for themselves. Um, a lot of this, this work, and you'll see this in a lot of our lessons, is group work. Because I want students talking to each other, right. not just to me, right? So I put them in groups. Uh, because I want them to bounce them up, those ideas around e with each other. And then that kid who says Statue of Liberty and the other kid says the guy stealing the bread have to have a discussion about that, right? Why? Why do you think that that's right? Okay, um, next. What action is taking place in the poster? What's the action going on here? Yeah, there, I mean, obviously we're at, right, we're at a harbor. There's a ship, looks like it's coming in. So the act, I would say the action of this is a ship coming into port. Or you could say a guy stealing bread. So that's an action. Um, so you've got, you, but you have the, you know, you want them to get, so what's the, what's the action? What's the thing that's happening? What's, what's going on? That's really what you're after with this part of it. What, what do you see happening in this poster? Um, now this next one is actually one of the more important ones when it comes to imagery, interpreting imagery. And that is, what is, what mood or tone is created by the poster? Now, a lot of times people will leave it at that question. Oh, okay, so for you, what mood or tone is being created here? What would you say is that? Optimism. Optimism, what else? Patriotism. Patriotism, good. What else? Hope, right? Um, so. Sharing. Sharing, okay. Because the guy is not actually stealing it, she's giving it to him. Um, so the. But now this is the important part. What is creating the mood or tone? What in the image? See, yeah. So it's it's uh, it's kind of a pastel-y kind of thing, right? So it's it's got a calming kind of a feel to it. It's not aggressive, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You also have though, right? If somebody said patriotism, they could point out the rainbow, right? Well, it's red, white, and blue. You could also say the rainbow as far as hope, right? So the idea is you want, the, you want the students to recognize what is it, how is this making you feel. But then what you want to do is you want to make the students realize what is making them feel that way. Okay, That's important because that part often gets left out. Why is that making you feel like that? In that photo, what is making you ang feel angry? Um, and then uh, what is the message the artist is giving uh, to the viewer. So take the words out, just look at the picture. What is the message the artist is, give, is sending? What's, yeah, we just, right, I mean, but you want to lead them down that way, right? Because if you take the words out, what is, the, what is our message, right? Our message is hopeful and it's sharing and it's, um, it's a caring kind of a thing. And it's also, that's an immigrant population just because of the dress, right? So that's important to bring out, too. Uh, and then uh, the last thing, what's the theme of the poster? Um, again, this applies a lot when you're talking about posters that don't have a lot of uh, text with them. You still want them to be able to pull the, 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 uh, the, the theme out of that. Um, so I know that was a really quick run through. Uh, but this particular, uh, this particular unit we have um, actually has about 20 different uh, posters, World War I posters, um, and uh, if you haven't, again, uh, I'd encourage you, if you haven't checked out 
uh, our uh, teaching literacy history curriculum online, uh, please do so. Um, also, just a quick plug, uh, we have about 6,000 affiliate schools across the country. If you're not an affiliate school, cost is a little prohibitive. It is free. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it's and kind of time consuming. It takes about 10 minutes to sign up. Um, and that gives you access to everything on our website, including those lessons. Thanks. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Just move this up. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Elaine said, I'm Amanda Moniz. I'm the assistant director of the National History Center, which is the program arm of the American Historical Association. And as uh, Elaine mentioned, before I went to grad school, I was a pastry chef for several years. Now, when I went to grad school, I thought I was leaving my cooking career behind me. I continued to cook and bake at home, but I, I thought professionally that that part of my life was just over. Then about a year and a half ago, it just suddenly dawned on me that, in fact, I could use historic recipes and cookbooks as another means to teach history and to excite people about history. And that's what I want to talk about with you um, this morning a little bit. Um, what I've mainly done with my uh, historic cooking classes is to teach them at a local cultural center, the Hill Center, which you saw in the videos Helen and Julia showed. And that's been a great experience. I've taught adults and kids, um, done them in as family classes or just adult classes. I also visited a, a girls' school in Washington and did a hands-on cooking project with them from one of the first, from the first uh, African American cookbook. Um, to teach them about uh, Civil War African-American experiences. And, and again, that was a great experience. But one thing that I found frustrating is when I've done these um, occasional classes at the Hill Center or visited the school, it, it was a one-off experience, I think, for the kids. There wasn't the groundwork and there wasn't any kind of follow-up. And I, so the way, you know, the, the way to use historic recipes to, to really integrate them into a curriculum is to have classroom teachers do it, experienced classroom teachers who know more than I do about teaching um, elementary or middle or high school students and who have the opportunity to develop the background and, and then to follow up, of course. And so I'm, I'm hoping that you'll consider working with historic cookbooks and uh, doing some hands-on cooking uh, projects. And, and I'm here to say that it is possible for you to do this in your classroom, even if you do not have an instructional kitchen in your school. <laughs> it, it, it can be done. Uh, so let me for, uh, first start by uh, pointing out, um, all right, the, this, um, this is, shows where the videos are, if you want to look at these videos that, that we saw, they're on the American Historical Association website under the um, teaching and learning tab, and then you'll go down and you can find the, the, these. Um, the rest of the videos are down here, and um, let's see. And if you follow the videos, the recipes are, are on the American Food Roots uh, website along with the videos. So this is one option for, for getting access to recipes. Now, if you, the, uh, as Laura and a couple of others have mentioned, the uh, warfare exhibit on the National World War I um, Museum's uh, website, this recipe book is, is up on the website. You see, the, the cookbook's on the left, and then the recipes that Laura were pointing out were over here. You can enter the cookbook. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. But first, first, let me ask: Has anyone ever worked with historic recipes or cookbooks with their students? Okay. Yeah. So, so not many uh, people have. The cookbooks are a great primary source 
for studying all aspects of American history. Um, I'm not as familiar with foreign cookbooks if you're teaching a world history class, so I, I'm afraid I don't know where to point you for that, although Helen perhaps may have some ideas. Um, these cookbooks can be used like other primary sources to explore topics. Uh, in the case of this one, if you look through the introductory material, and there are several pages of introductory material in the cookbook, like just like there are in your cookbooks you might have at home, you know, cookbooks typically have an introduction. These are rich sources for understanding how people are thinking about uh, their time period, um, you know, in this case, the war. You can learn about um, public, the shaping of public opinion, women's roles, uh, Wilson's leadership, uh, how he projected himself as a leader through these cookbooks. That's in the introduction of the cookbook, and then in the introductions to each of the sections, there also is some um, you know, introductory material that can be analyzed you know, the, the way you would analyze other primary sources uh, to understand the time period. what you can do at, at home. And these, these uh, are really uh, captivating accounts that, uh, you know, of encouraging women at home to think about how they're cooking to play a role in the war. In addition, you can, of course, use the cookbook as a cookbook. And so why do I think this is valuable for helping to teach history? There are a few reasons. The first is that it gives, making a historic recipe gives students a sensory experience of the past. It's not going to be the same as eating a rest, as something would have tasted 100 years ago, or if you're using an older cookbook, a couple hundred years ago, because ingredients change. You're going to have to make little adaptations for modern cooking, but those are some things you can talk about with your students. Why are we making adaptations? How are we, um, you know, is, is it authentic or, you know, are we changing, um, you know, the primary source? It, you know, it, it forces students to think about questions about primary sources and interpretation when they're working with a recipe. But it, but it does, um, at the end of the day, give them a sensory experience of the past. And so it's exciting and engaging in a way similar to uh, reading a story. It captures the imagination through, um, through the taste buds and the feel and the smell in a way that, you know, dates just aren't going to excite some, some students. That's one reason. Another reason is um, it gives students an experience of the labor, what, what labor was like in the past. Uh, now, a lot of these recipes use um, modern technology uh, more similar to what we have. It's not obviously the same as the technology you would have in your kitchen today, but some of them are using um, you, you know, um, um, electric mixers or electric choppers and things like that. If you use um, older cookbooks or some of these recipes, depending on what the recipe is, you will be doing more manual labor, and that does give students um, a sense of what labor in a kitchen was like 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Uh, in one of the classes I taught at the Hill Center, we made uh, beaten biscuits, uh, which are a traditional mid-Atlantic Maryland dish, and it involves beating biscuits for an hour. No kidding you, an hour. <laughs> and this was before, oh, we did it for about half an hour, <laughs> but it's, um, the, this was before chemical leaveners like baking powder and baking soda uh, were, were really widely embraced. You, you, you beat the thing, and it, it, amazingly, I, I really didn't think this would, I, I honestly didn't know what would happen. I, I was so skeptical, I don't know if you've made them, but it actually, um, beating them breaks down the, um, it creates a chemical change that, that um, causes the, the biscuits to, to rise the way baking powder causes it to rise. But by beating for an hour, you get the, um, uh, an understanding of how demanding women's labor, in this case, this was from an African-American cookbook, you know, of enslaved labor or free black labor. And, and that's, that's the kind of um, thing you just don't get from, from reading a textual source necessarily. So the experience of labor is, is another reason, along with the sensory experience. And then another reason is that um, content. Uh, this is, as Helen and Julia were explaining to us, we, eating wheatless and meatless meals was an important aspect 
for Americans on the home front during World War I. There were strategic reasons, uh, cultural reasons, and so on. People were encouraged to do this. You get content through the recipes. And a last reason, I think, for cooking, uh, using historic recipes with students is that when you make a recipe, often students, especially if it's good, but even if it's peculiar, students may go home and make it again. I found in the historic cooking classes I've done, people tell me, oh, you know, I made that, that cake we made in the class. And when you make a recipe, particularly if it's got an interesting story, you're likely to, to share the story. And that means you're reinforcing your knowledge. And we, we know that students and people learn well when they have to then go out and teach it. So it gives people a way, it gives students a way to teach something themselves that will reinforce what they've learned about the time period. All right, but now you're, you're still wondering, can I make these recipes in my class room? Do, do any of you have, are any of your school, do any of your schools have instructional kitchens? Okay. Uh, so not many people. I mean, some schools have them, and that's great. If you, if you have an instructional kitchen, that's great. You can, and if you have a, a culinary teacher, you have lots of options of what you can um, do. For instance, oh, sorry. Um, some of these biscuit recipes. Th these would be you really would need uh, an oven, unless you. Um, so you would need an oven to make most of these uh, baked goods. Uh, but one thing that's nice about these recipes is, for instance, here, the, the tea biscuits include wheat flour, but also barley flour. So a student is seeing there's a substitution of wheat flour. You're supposed to be saving wheat, and, and you're using some barley flour in, in place of it. So, you know, this is um, getting at the, the idea of wheatless. Days. And one thing Helen explains in one of the uh, videos is that I, I was surprised. I thought that wheatless really meant wheatless, but actually it means just less wheat. As, as Helen explains, you know, giving up wheat was a sacrifice. So people were cutting back on the amount of wheat. They weren't giving it up entirely. A lot of these recipes do have some wheat flour and then um, some barley flour or buckwheat flour or rye flour. And those uh, kind of flours, if you're not uh, a baker yourself, are pretty readily uh, available at grocery star stores. These are not exotic ingredients that are hard to find. Let's see. Um, so it, if you don't have an instructional kitchen and wanted to make something like this, you know, the, the, the option would be have the students prep it, and, you know, that involves mixing the ingredients by hand or by, by by spoon or whatnot, and then you, if, if you're able to make it at home and bring in the finished product so they can taste it, that's an option. But that's, that's not practical for a lot of people. The legumes section is great, especially if you have an instructional kitchen and want to make things like soybean croquettes that we make in one of the videos. But if you don't want to make some of these recipes that are, you know, more complicated, something like the date, the stuffed dates that we sh that um, we saw in one of the videos is something that is very easy to do in a classroom. It was dates, you need pitted dates, uh, cream cheese, um, nuts, and if, you, if your school doesn't allow you to use nuts, you can substitute sunflower seeds. That's a good alternative for nuts, because a lot of school districts, of course, don't allow nuts anymore. And then mayonnaise. You know, you, you, all you have to do is take the date, stuff it with some cream cheese, roll it in the nuts, and dip it in mayonnaise, and you have an authentic World War I recipe. And, and it's good, as Helen and Julia, you, you know, you saw in the video, it, it, it sounds peculiar, right? But it actually tasted very good. Um, we all had seconds. Yeah, that, that, that was really good. Um, Try that one, like, that was one of the ones that like, oh no. No, 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 it was good, let's see. Uh, so so that, that's the kind of thing that could easily be done in, um, Sorry, this is not as easy to. You could easily do in a in a um, in a classroom. All right, 
Another option is something like this Elmhurst salad. Again, a date, a cream cheese kind of situation. Uh, here, what you're doing is, is, the recipe calls for dates, cream cheese, salt, paprika, lettuce, and French dressing. All of those easily available at a grocery store. You can buy bottled French dressing. We, we've learned that bottled food is you know, an authentic part of the World War I uh, experience. Um, so, so that's legit. You don't have to make it from scratch. And all you need is a couple uh, you know, plastic bowls, mash up the cream cheese with the paprika. The recipe says to stone the dates and fill with the cream cheese, which has been seasoned and with the salt and paprika. So you need little bowls, cream cheese, paprika, salt, mash it together, stuff it into the dates, put it on the lettuce attractively, and, and try it with the with the French dressing. And this I have not tried. I mean, that does sound very peculiar, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but, but your students might find it if, uh, you know, um, they might like it. I mean, the weird, you know, a lot of these recipes actually are good, um, but, the, you know, the weird factor is, is sort of fun. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's peculiar. It's better than asking people to bring Fluffy to school and, and cooking him, so. <laughs> which would have been authentic, too. Um, <laughs> here's another good recipe. I, and this will be the last recipe I wanted to show you. And then I would actually love to hear from Tim uh, to see if he has thoughts on how, um, how you could apply the kind of framework he, he was showing us with the, with the visual images to cookbooks. If, if, I'd love to have a conversation. Um, kidney bean salad, also. Um, I'm sorry. It's, I, uh, I'm having trouble getting this. Anyway, the kidney bean salad is another very basic recipe. It includes kidney beans, sweet pickles, and celery. And, and again, these are all recipes that are readily available at the grocery store. You need a knife to chop the celery. You can even buy diced celery at some grocery stores. Maybe a knife to, to cut pickles, and that doesn't need to be a sharp knife. Pickles are not hard to cut. I mean, you know, you have to think practically. What, what, what can you do? What, what's safe? And, and so on. Mix these ingredients together and, and students, you know, can have, a, again, a taste of something that was substituting beans for meat and, you know, I think further understand, um, you know, understand, understand in a sensory way, in a hands-on way, what substituting um, these foods meant for Americans on the home front. So, but before uh, we uh, turn to what if any thoughts Tim might have, I just want to emphasize this is practical. It is doable in your classroom, even without an instructional kitchen. So I do hope you'll consider using recipes. And I would love to hear from you if you think this is practical, doable, uh, or what considerations you might have that I may not have thought about because I'm not in a, a classroom um, doing this because it is something I, I'm really working to try and develop um, for the World War I era but also for other eras um, because I do believe uh, historic recipes and historic cookbooks offer us a, a, an unusual way of teaching, an unusual and engaging way of teaching uh, history to students. Uh, yeah, no, I, using food in the classroom is great. Uh, I, I've um, I've had my students uh, make hardtack, um, and if you want to, you know, because uh, you can, and then, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, see, that's what I'm, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you have them create worm castles, uh, you know, that, like, that's what their nickname, uh, you know, and uh, that's, that one's easy, and that one's fun, because they can go, wow, really, they survived on this, that's, in, that's insane. Um, you know, I've done, gang, uh, you know, uh, Yankee uh, pudding, and we've done uh, hasty pudding. I mean, and we've you know, uh, so yeah, authentic food is really a fun way to bring your kids. And the other thing is that's interesting about what you're talking about here is having the kids look at the sort of the etymology of the ingredients, um, as far as uh, well, why wouldn't they eat this here? <laughs> they didn't have it, you know, they, they didn't have access to it. Um, Actually, uh, Livy O'Connell has a new book um, on American history through food, which is really a fun, a fun read. I wrote a review on uh, not too long ago, and it's um, uh, it, it's interesting because she talks about 
sort of the nutritional value of beaver tail, you know, which we don't get into much anymore. But um, but there are uh, but yeah, no, uh, food is a really and and uh, it's also the the maybe the primary value of it in your classroom is is the kids are actually listening while you're talking about it because they find it interesting, um, and uh, so no, it's a great way to engage them. Yeah. So, so would yeah. you? You know, food is interesting because it's both a primary source and it's a medium of, of conveying information. But I was wondering, when you, would you see a way to do something like you know, showed us here with the poster, oh, if, yeah. if, when you were tasting the food, you know, describe? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that, right, you're absolutely right. And the, um, u using that, using that, uh, <laughs> no, those, uh, using those same things that, um, you know, the, a close, uh, reading of your, you know, your other senses beside your sight. Yeah, um, you know, is it is it salty? Is it tangy? Is it you know what's making it salty or tangy or you know what it, what? Why would they have added, um, you know, a uh, you know an ingredient? Well, because this ingredient makes it sweet. Taste it before you add that in and see what you you know see what you get. Um, no, of course, yeah. And and the thing again, it's breaking having making the students break down the process. Right, that's, that's part of the whole critical thinking process, making the students break down the components, whether it's a poster, whether it's a recipe, um, you know, uh, whether it's a reading, a primary source reading, um, getting back to that uh, so that they can see the, the genesis of, of anything, any kind of a primary source, whether it's a, something you're tasting, something you're seeing, or something you're reading, yeah. yeah. I would like to add something to that also, and I think one of the things we all really wanna do in the classroom is not only, and I, concur with you about having kids look at images or tasting food together is identity. And there are always those very quiet students who have maybe come recently to the United States who have an identity issue around food that's interesting and maybe even has an aspect of what it means to really be hungry, which many kids in the United States have but they don't verbalize it, while other kids <laughs> have never experienced it. So this whole idea of food winning the war in terms of famine or availability, um, identity and food is very highly connected um, in these kinds of recipes. Yeah, and the, the populations that I, that I taught, um, the schools that I taught in were all Title I schools, and uh, the last, the, the school that was mentioned at the, in the, my introduction, um, th that school is 97% free reduced lunch and 24 native languages. Hmm. And a lot of people don't realize, but Salt Lake City is a port of entry for the United States. Mm -hmm. And so um, whenever there was a world crisis, I knew who, who my next group of students were going to be. So when Chernobyl happened, I got Ukrainian kids, and I got Eastern European kids, and I got Russian kids. When uh, the, the um, Her Bosnia Herzegovina all fell apart, um, the Serbian kids and Bosnian kids, and the, and recently uh, waves of uh, kids from Somalia, Kenya, Mali. So all of those cultures bring all of their experience as far as food goes and their interpretation of food. I had a, a Pakistani refugee uh, family who on Thanksgiving brought in turkey that they had done Pakistani style <laughs> because they couldn't find the foods in the supermarket that they were used to preparing. Um, and so they took, and they took what they could find in our supermarket and culturized it with spices and preparation uh, in order to make it uh, their own. And so that history is now, and it's very well reflected in this, especially when you're talking about you know, immigrant foods, um, pastas and sauces and so on, and they would take whatever we had, they had, could find here, and, yet, and then reinterpret it uh, to fit their own, you know, their own culture, which created brand new norms uh, in America. Yeah. And if I might say to, to this point, and you may just have to repeat me, and then my friends are going, in this book, if you're trying to do this with your kids, there's a, a recipe for possum, and that would be a great way to do the, you just start off with that, and then you can get them to that whole conversation, because uh, it's, 
not quite as bad as the past, but it does make you go, oh, possum. Right, so that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. So Laura was talking about a recipe for possum that's in one of these books, is because we all have identity issues around mm -hmm. food. It's not just that, you know, I think sometimes, you know, our students can think, well, other people have these sort of strange foods that they eat. But we, we eat strange foods too, and there are lots of foods that we don't eat for strange reasons. You know, if we don't want to eat possum or beaver tail or cat, that's not biological, that's not natural, that's cultural. And I think looking at food historically is such a great way to highlight that for students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have questions? Yeah, it, it's more of a comment. Um, I've been doing this uh, teaching for over 20 years, but it, it seems, it always seemed amazing to me that we'd look for ways for students to feel, to read, to smell, to hear, but the one sense that always seemed to be the void is, is taste mm -hmm. from that. And uh, you know, other networks like the Food Channel have made uh, a whole area of study. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're onto something really here. And why did our food taste change? And how were things introduced? And how did they become part of our culture? Um, one, one of the first times that I introduced this taste part uh, and smell is when we talk about um, the Silk Road and uh, the Columbian Exchange and that. And then we have, I bring things into the classroom, different spices and so on. And uh, we talk, and I have the students smell it and we take whole cloves and we, you know, and they, and they taste things. We, you know, and we, we do that. And so that, and salt. Uh, why you know why is salt such a big sugar deal? fat salt uh, yeah. that people can't do without yeah and and the you know and it's a uh, it's and and it makes it real for the students instead of something in it you know in a, a, a two dimensional thing in a textbook it becomes a real thing for them history and, becomes uh, and I think know. before long they realize hey I'm learning history I'm learning why that happened. yeah it sneaks in why this is omitted or why even if you went back to World War One and and um, maybe it's not taste but it's the elimination of things like you know, sauerkraut and hamburgers and mm -hmm. those types of things that we do culturally. Uh, you did with your presentation, the, the skinny man who ate the French foods versus the beans and the mm -hmm. things like that. The other thing is that it also brings in other purposes for food besides nutrition. So for instance, uh, we talk about you know, taking, you take a, a handful of spice and you throw it into a bag with oranges and the oranges are going to last through the sea voyage and you're not going to get scurvy. Um, you talk about that you can, you know, what natural preservatives, you know, if you, if you don't put this in this, it's not going to last. Um, well, why is that, why is that particular ingredient in this recipe? Well, it's so that the food will last longer, not necessarily because it needs it for the flavor. It's because you want it to, it's a preservative. Thank you. Going back to the identity issue, I just wanted to highlight this, this cookbook includes, as Helen and Julia talk about, many uh, so-called foreign recipes. So there are a few recipes for carrots different ways, a Yiddish carrot recipe, a Japanese recipe, there's a Danish carrot recipe, which work nicely, especially, for instance, the Yiddish recipe in conjunction with some of the posters we saw, which are in Yiddish or other in, in other foreign languages uh, that we also, uh, in one of the videos, make something called a mandalay salad, which is an interpretation of a Burmese dish. There are things um, in this or some of the other World War I cookbooks called Egyptian salad or Hindu salad. So, you know, if you're trying to connect with a diverse student body or just to teach your students about all the foreign influences on American cuisine, the cookbooks really are quite broad in, in what they offer. I love being the last speaker before lunch. <laughs> Can I just tell you that's the best spot to be in? Do a quick switch out here. Good morning. Good morning. Come on, I'm the last speaker before lunch. This is a good thing, right? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lynn O'Hara. I'm the director of programs for National History Day. One of the things that my job is is to really kind of help make connections. One of the things that you will see, oh good, it's gonna work. Life is always good when the technology works. You're my proof it worked. It might stop working, but that's okay. One of my goals, you may have heard of National History Day. Do I have History Day teachers in the crowd? My people, I like you, thanks. Say hi to me afterwards, make sure you're on my listserv. But one of my goals in History Day, and what we're most known for is our contest. 
It's great students in grade 6 to 12, they do historical research, they compete regional, state, national level. That's great. That's about 2% of my job. My goal as director of programs as I came in in 2013 was to really make links into helping develop history education. And one of the resources that came out of this, so I started in 2013, and about two weeks into my job, my boss came to me and said, okay, we have a funding for a project that was started before you, go, before you came here. It's a project on World War I. We need to teach a resource. You've got about six months. Go. And I thought, wow, that's a high stakes assessment to get us started. Um, and what the way that this worked and what this has resulted in is the World War I book that's on the back table. Please help yourself. Take them. Take them back for colleagues. My goal is to get these in the hands of teachers. So one of the things as a teacher who's worked in US history, European history, world history, is trying to figure out what the resources are. Because the reality is, when you start teaching World War I, there's so many different ways it can go, right? Time is a huge factor. How much do I spend? Do I spend one day on this, four days on this, four weeks on this? There's never enough time. The second thing you find is that there's a couple narratives that are out there over and over and over again. So one of those examples is trenches. You know, we've all heard the horror stories and the trench foot and the rats, and that always gets a good, good laugh when you can show some rat pictures. Um, and the other thing you see is tanks. Here's an American tank, here's a British tank, here's a funny tank, it must be French, I wonder why they lost. And the reality is there's so many more stories. So one of the things that I did was to reach out to some of History Day's traditional and some new partners and said, okay, give me some of your best, most unique, and different kinds of resources. I said, I want things that people haven't seen before, and I want something that's a little off the beaten path. And we worked with World War I Museum, Army, Navy, Marine Corps Heritage, Library of Congress, National Archives, Smithsonian. Quite frankly, as a former teacher, I'm amazed. I call these places, they call me back. They send me things. They say yes, and I, I, you know, I'm still a little amazed by that. But what I said was, get beyond the traditional story. And what we've created from that is our resource. Now, the resource has a couple key things to it. First off, we talked about the idea of perspective. This came up in the session we were talking about yesterday. Do you look at it from the US perspective, from the European perspective? So we actually went out to some of our master teachers and said, OK, let's talk about perspective. And actually, the one that's most surprising to most people is China and Japan. Let's talk about the fact that there are Chinese and Japanese laborers. Let's talk about the fact that you know, Wilson's ideas of nationalism and self-determination show up when a guy named Ho Chi Minh shows up at the Versailles conference and says, you know, come seat me, I want to talk about this for my nation. And we say, no, 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 go away, we don't really want to talk to you. I would just tell the kids, be careful who you kick off your cafeteria table, it might come back to bite you one day. <laughs> we also worked with Laura at the World War I Museum and also the Army Heritage Center to say, look at the ways, what kinds of questions should we ask in the classroom? What are some topics and some research avenues for students? But one of the things that always frustrated me when I was teaching is that a lot of these resources were very prescripted. It was do this in this way, in this order. And I said, look, teachers really need the ability to cherry pick. They really need the ability to adapt. And they really need the ability to take the idea and shift it to different levels. Uh, by the end of my teaching career, I tended to teach the two extremes in high school. I taught the AP US history, and then I taught co-taught special ed English language learner. If you had something special to you, you absolutely were in my classroom. Um, and don't think those AP kids aren't special. They're just special in a different way. But one of the ways that I really tried to push this is to look at the resource in a different way. So what I said was, OK, we can't just do a book. Books are nice, but books are limiting. So what we did was the book is connected to a website. It's really easy. It's nhd.org slash World War I. What you can do is read the book. You can download a PDF version of the book. But what's most importantly, the book contains eight lesson plans. In addition to the eight plans in the book, there's an additional nine plans on the website. And it's designed to be adaptable for what you need. So half the lessons are designed for middle school, grades six to eight. Half are designed for high school. But one of the things that you'll see is that if you pick a lesson and you open it up, you not only get the lesson module, but you get all of the materials that you need to do it. The materials, as much as humanly possible, are there as Word and Excel documents. And that's absolutely intentional. So for example, you might choose this lesson on reporting on World War I. 
This lesson uses Chronicling America articles from the Library of Congress to talk about how the war was being talked about. And I believe the author chooses a set of eight different articles. Well, realistically, that might not work for you based on time, resources, reading levels for your students. So you might say, you know what, I really want to focus on these two or these three. That's fine. The graphic organizers there just chop off the lines that you don't want or that you don't need. Truly, my goal with History Day is expanding it. Expanding it beyond the traditional contest model to really getting the idea of resources out for teachers. Sometimes they are physical resources. Sometimes they are online resources. We do a series of webinars and Google Hangouts. Uh, sometimes we're working with developing teacher institutes. But my goal is to help improve history and that by doing so and providing these opportunities and resources for teachers, that helps you provide to your students avenues for research. Because I know as a teacher there are things that we have our specialties in and then there's what you get assigned to teach, right? <laughs> Ancient history, that was me. Mesopotamia, I didn't remember anything about that. And then I had a class of sixth graders in front of me and they didn't know anything about it either. So we had to figure it out together. Um, same with economics, wow, that was another eye opener. But one of the things that I think is that I want to create resources that are out there so that when you are there, when you get hit on this class, you've got something to go to. Um, so I just, I'm going to pass things off to Q&A because I know we're running a little late on time and you got to get out to lunch, that's important. Um, but just to say thank you for including us, for thinking about this. If you have more questions about History Day or listserv or things like that, come see me afterwards. So thank you. So questions for anybody? Hi, Elisa Herrera from the History Teacher Journal. Um, I really appreciate this um, presentation and speaking of cookbooks and history, getting people interested in general, just holiday baking. I pulled out some of the old cookbooks from the 1950s and you can see specifically it refers to the housewife will do this or it's, a, it's an avenue to express their creativity. And then they proceed to make some sort of like savory meat jelly, like an aspic that we're not necessarily familiar with. So to see how um, just children get involved with that and you can insert history in ways that they wouldn't know is really exciting. Uh, and I had a question about um, food specific approaches. It seems like this is about teaching World War I and using food as a medium to teach that. Um, I've been developing um, kind of ambitious projects uh, using McDonald's as a medium to teach you know, any number of aspects of cultural history, whether it's agricultural to architectural or so forth, uh, labor history and children's history, that always gets a lot of interest. Um, so since this one is specifically about World War I, have you developed uh, maybe framework questions? So if someone's teaching World War II or ancient history or whatever the case may be, but they want to use food as that medium, um, have you produced like a framework of uh, identity, nutrition, agriculture, something that anyone from any class could just grab and start exploring through food? I think one of the ways you can look at it is by bringing in gender expectations because so normally we associate women with the preparation of the food. And feeding soldiers, I put um, an image in here and it's on the World War I website. How do you set up a kitchen at an, at an army facility to feed soldiers? How do you feed the prisoners of war? There's a great photograph on the World War I Museum of a US soldier feeding a wounded enemy prisoner of war, literally spoon feeding him. So you can look at it from the humanitarian perspective. You can look at it from women having to relinquish um, producing food to men producing food in these field kitchens. You can look at it for women not having the food, you know, to feed their children. So that's one way to look at it. And then what, what are the um, impacts on children when they don't have enough to eat? And what happens to the relationship between the mother and the child where she's not able to feed that child? And then the tension between countries who are producing the food and distributing it, I think you can go there too.
Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I haven't developed a framework per se, but I teach, um, I teach at the college level, but I teach a lot of food history classes. And I think there are certainly big questions that come up over and over again that could really apply to World War I, but also all over the place, really. Mm -hmm. And one is certainly gender. One is labor, agriculture, food safety and preservation, which is something that can be um, maybe off our radar today only because we're so fortunate. Yeah. But for so many people, how you were going to preserve the food and it, as a result, how you cooked it and how you dealt with it were, were the most pressing questions that you had um, because food had to last through the winter. And so most of the cooking before the 1920s really revolved around um, different preservation techniques. Um, you know, of course, distribution and, and beliefs about food. If you look at a 19th century cookbook, so many of the cooking times are for, you know, an hour, an hour and a half for things like mm -hmm. vegetables, which, <laughs> which seems crazy to us today. You know, we're like, oh, they lost all the vitamins. But to them, they, many, many people believed that foods were indigestible without that sort of cooking. So I think cultural beliefs about food, these are just big thematic mm -hmm. ideas that jump out at me. But I, I really think there are certainly commonalities. And that's, that's a really interesting idea, developing a sort of framework. Yeah, I'll just kind of jump in. Um, we have not developed a framework. One of the things that Helen and I were actually hoping to do, and it hasn't happened yet, but if people want to join us, uh, we were hoping to have lesson plans actually associated with the videos so oh, that, excellent. you know, lesson plans would be, I mean, part of the issue is we are not K through 12 teachers, and so we don't develop lesson plans for the K through 12 classroom. Um, but, but if anyone would like to sort of join, it's, it can be an evolving and an ongoing project. <laughs> and I think that the point about a sort of a more universal framework for thinking about not just World War I, but World War II, um, you know, the Civil War, the, I'm sorry, I'm an, American, I'm an Americanist, but, you know, thinking about different, uh, different eras, uh, you know, different eras, different wars, different periods. I think that, that's a really great question, so, uh, yeah, or idea. Yeah, the collaboration's so. great, and I think you guys, if we had that universal framework, we would all come to you asking questions. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that would be great. So. The only thing that occurred to me with framework is, and just listening to the conversation, you might think about going from, from micro to macro. So if you started with, uh, you know, gender roles and a, you know, a, a woman in, supposed to be in the kitchen and the man on the front lines thing, and then go to the, go to the, the macro of food as a tool of, of, of war or diplomacy. Um, and world politics, um, and I mean, I think that then you could you could start with this level with the students, you know, which is more, you know, uh, uh, edible, and then move up to you know something that has a much larger scope, and that that would they'd have a better feel for it. Thank you. Let me just come on up. I just wanted to add one other thing that goes along with what Tim just said. Migration um, is another focus for that whole notion of food, how people get to where they are, what they bring with them in terms of migration. Hi, I thought this was really interesting. And I have two questions that are sort of related. I wonder if in the letters that the soldiers wrote home, if they make any mention of food, and also, if after World War I, they're coming back from Europe with a different sense of taste, a different set of foods that they try to bring back to their small towns or their big cities. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. I mean, certainly, um, you know, some of the, the relief workers who I study who are in places, uh, you know, you really see a sort of cultural, um, often uh, sometimes exploration, depending on if they're more optimistic, sometimes disdain if they're more pessimistic. You know, I'm thinking of this nurse who was stationed in Serbia, and she was, she was writing very critically about the black bread that she had to eat and the, the you know, and the, 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 the bitter spices. And I mean, so obviously there are these sort of, you know, cultural um, exchanges that are taking place as people are are you know, encountering new foods, new cuisines, um, and and uh, you know that is in, that is obviously food. You know, you're, you're, you eat you know three meals a day if you're, if you're lucky, um, and and people are that is a way that they are experiencing different uh, different environments uh, that they're now. In. So yeah, a lot of people do reflect on that. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, of course, they thought they were really approving of the food that they were meeting. It's so tired as a trope, but I do have American soldiers eating French food and writing back and saying, wow, it's really good. <laughs> you know, I think, I think this recipe is spelled, and you know, they'll try to interpret, and you go back, oh, I think they're trying to spell pomme de terre, you know, but it's, it's hard to see because they're, you know, they're just kind of writing out what they were hearing. Um, but I do, I do see some of that. What they were mainly eating was rations supplied by the US government. Sure. And in general, the rations for U.S. soldiers were pretty ample, so there weren't too many complaints on that score. Okay, thanks.
Well, apropos the uh, previous question, if you were to go to uh, any major U.S. Army base, for instance, let's say Fort Dix, uh, in Bordentown, the areas around, you'll find an inordinate number, for instance, uh, Korean restaurants at one point, Vietnamese at another, and depending on the generation, as the troops rotate back, they bring back taste for kimchi or what have you. So that's certainly uh, a constant in American military experience. Uh, regarding a, sort of a broader context of what we've been talking about, um, there's a great course, those DVDs that are always advertised on the Times on the uh, history of food. And uh, I forget the name of the guy who wrote, uh, who did the uh, course. But in any case, each of the various lessons is highlighted by some historic recipe. And if you watch the DVD, he goes through the preparation of it, and he addresses so many of the themes, be it gender, or trade, or, uh, or a preservation, and so on and so forth, and all of these things. And, all. and it's a really interesting thing if you're just getting started in the field and trying to broaden out beyond just American history in terms of global history. Yeah, that just comments. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one thing I might add to, uh, Amanda earlier had mentioned some of the, the recipes in the cookbook that have names such as um, Hindu salad, Mandalay salad, Egyptian salad. And you know these are also these, these American ideas of what the, the so-called exotic world is. I mean, so you know these sort of conceptions of what you know exotic food, foreign food is, which are very rarely based on any sort of reality whatsoever. Um, but you know it's it's kind of interesting thinking about the ways that you know let's say let's a housewife in the middle of Iowa is, is imagining uh, Burma or is imagining you know Egypt. I mean, we can see these sort of ideas about what the foreign are that aren't necessarily always based on truth. But then, uh, as you point out. Sometimes, uh, you know, actual ideas, actual influences are coming back and being hybridized and and sort of repurposed um, and you know, becoming becoming these new foods. So, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, U.S. or or you know, any sort of um, interactions abroad certainly do change the way that that people eat and and do create these major shifts in uh, food ways and eating habits. Yeah, one, one thing that's really interesting to me looking at this period is what foods get called foreign and what foods don't. Because, of course, Americans had been eating all sorts of foreign foods in the sense that they were imported for, you know, forever. You know, eating cinnamon or tapioca or coffee or tea, uh, sugar in some cases, um, you know, foods that were imported internationally, tapioca, vanilla, um, but that they, they didn't think of as foreign and they don't show up as being foreign. But then, you know, at other times you'll have this salad that's made with the Mandalay salad that Amanda made that's just rice and peas and a tiny bit of curry powder. And it's like, whoa, foreign, this is exotic. You know, so I think that's, that's really a, a good teaching moment to sort of say what, what was going on here, what were people thinking about. Are there any more questions? I'm Dana Schaefer, staff with the AHA. Um, well, I wanted to first thank all of our panelists for doing such a terrific job today. We, I really, really was impressed with all of it, and I thank you very much. So. <laughs> all of exciting stuff. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I wanted to make a brief mention tonight. We have a networking reception. Um, four K through 12 attendees of the conference. It's at seven o'clock. Um, let me check my phone. It's uh, at the Hilton Clinton room. That's the second floor. Um, a lot of the AHA's teaching division will be there. We'd love to get your feedback, some ideas on what other programs we can do um, uh, at the future annual meetings and throughout the year. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks to our sponsors and uh, we hope you enjoy the annual meeting. <laughs>